if this doesn't work, I'm just going to, I'm just going to quit. I'm done. <laughs> I'm just going to record it separately oh, again. Go back home. Yep. I, I give, I give up. Okay. What do I do? Do not disturb until this evening. I don't think one hour is going to cover it. Not for these pen casts. No. Gosh. No. It won't be another 245 though. No, let's, let's go longer. Let's break that oh, record. God. I got to go home. I know I do too. <laughs> My kids got a middle school. Oh, that's thing. right. Rachel was yep. telling me about that. Cookies. Cookies and coffee and curriculum, I there think is go. what it's called. I'm Sounds like, good. I like two out of those. Two three out of three. Things. Yeah, exactly. All right. You ready? Yes. Let's just go forth. Here we go. Sally right. Ho. <clears throat> Sally Forth. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 70. 70 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. And I am Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we are going to be talking about a functional way for storing 100 plus pens. We have our favorite pens for each filling mechanism type and which filling mechanism we feel is the best. Love making those decisions. Being Easy. Put on the spot. Uh, why blind caps are called blind caps and what those are, if you're not familiar. Uh, if it's okay to write with someone else's fountain pen or if the unique writing styles will alter the nib or mess it up. Don't even look at my pens. I won't. They're all brown anyway. I don't want anything to do with those. I'm just kidding. Um, how long bottled ink can last, especially if it's stored for a very long time. And we're going to be spotlighting the Jinhao X159. Uh -oh. There's an X now. There's an X in front of the 159. And we'll be sharing how our Thanksgivings went since that happened, uh, where we had some turkeys and potentially some hammocks because it was pretty warm. Oh. There was some hammock action happening at the Goulet household. Anyway, let's kick it off with some feedback. Feeding back today. Mm. Well, first I wanted to just say, um, thank you to Adrian who came on last week, the last yes. episode. Uh, she is our customer care manager. And she asked me to remind everybody that our customer care team here is not just a bunch of people sitting around hoping that phones don't ring and live chats don't happen and emails never come in. They want to talk to you. They get mm -hmm. excited about that. She said, let people know we want to talk to them. If they are just curious, they don't have to wait until there's a problem. If they're just wondering if they should get this or that, or if they don't know the difference between this thing or that thing, please let them know. Email info at gouletpens.com. Go on our website. If the chat with us icon is there, that means there is somebody ready, willing, and happy to chat with you about anything pen related. So please take advantage of our team. They really do get jazzed up about this stuff and they are excited to do so with you at any time. Thank you. Well said. And then Rubik's Joe 15 nice. said, Thanks, Brian and Drew. This was one of the best PenCast episodes. Now, that might seem like a pretty average comment, but uh -huh. do you recall that it was two hours and 45 minutes, Brian? I don't recall. I sort of fell into a vortex of some kind, and then just like we time traveled, and uh, we looked up, and it was like, oh my gosh, how long have we been recording? What kind of man, Joe, <laughs> thinks that a two hour and 45 minute episode is the best one? I think Joe knows a good thing when he sees it. Oh, I think Joe's a crazy man, but you know what? I love mm. him for it. So, we're going to move on. Thank you, Joe to mm -hmm. Joan Worthman, and Joan says, I still think we need a sticker that says, the pencast made me do it, with a picture <laughs> of the Drule feed cleaner. Harumph. Mm. So apparently they're salty about the fact that this doesn't exist, hence the harumph. Oh. But uh, oh. yeah, I uh, am all for a <clears throat> pencast made me do it sticker. However, you know, that that's, that's, that's uh, us basically endorsing blame <laughs> for a multitude of things. Like, who knows what that could get stuck on? I mean, are we endorsing it or are we just kind of embracing what's I don't know. happening? I don't like, know. Like, like, what in the world could a car with that on its bumper do? What kind of chaos? That's true. I don't Maybe know. Maybe that opens up some legal, like, liabilities It does, it for does. Us. This guy gets pulled over and the cop's like, oh, oh. Well, I'm going to ignore you. I know where to Pencast. go. Pencast, Pencast made me do it. I'm going to go to the Vegoulet Pen Company. We do not endorse crimes of any kind. Mm. So do not use us as justification <laughs> for... Anything negative But that's in that what a way. sticker would does. It's basically <laughs> us putting the mark of Zorro on everything everybody touches that is devious hmm. and ill-advised. Can we use the pencast maybe do it as a justification for ourselves? 
Or is that uh, a conflict of interest, perhaps? I might be able to, because the the, mm-hmm. the CEO would probably get blamed. But then again, Rachel technically is the owner, so Rachel's uh, sort of my boss. So, so we can, mean, yeah, I guess. Yeah? Can we use that as a loose justification? Yeah, she, she wouldn't do anything bad to us. I'm sure. All right. <laughs> All right. We'll try it out. I don't want to invoke. We'll test rat. it out, and if it works really well, we might have to stick with <laughs> that thing. All right. And then finishing things up, Justice Castillo says two questions: Can we see Drew's recipe or gardening journal? What are y'all using for your 2023 planners slash journals? I added this one in the comments, not the questions, because it's a super quick answer. Uh, No, you cannot see it, Justice. I'm sorry, (laughs) uh, because it is a hodgepodge mess and very frequently updated. And I will say that... um, Maybe that would be encouraging for folks. They'd be like, oh... If if they're that bad at it, maybe there's hope for me. Okay, well, you know is that what? inspiring? I don't really know. I don't even know if I have it with me. My journaling. Oh no. My my journaling situation oh, is truly the hodgest of podges. Yeah. So this isn't even a good book. Um, this was given to me by uh, Mr. Roy Kim. So um, let's see. Uh, yeah. What is that? It's what, just what it's, is this journal? It's an Uncharted journal with a fake bullet hole in it. It's from the video game Uncharted. I mean, that's cool. Um, How's the paper in that? It's fine. Is it acceptable? It's fine. It's, 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 it's like, I like, well, look at this. I just you realize you work. Look at this. I have just random, la- randomly drew the bad guy from Princess and the Frog for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why he's there, but. You did that? I did. Roy, Roy didn't do that before. Look, like, here's where I wrote house plants about like, you know, when I'm going to water them, what I'm going to do. I think I might even have a watering thing in here about like, just when I thought for sure I was going to keep a, keep a, you know, good watering log. Never did that. You have so, a lot of writing on like the right side. Totally abandoned. Of the journal, but not the left well, side. Well, it doesn't stay closed very well, so I often have to. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Is it like, I didn't know if that was like a bleed through issue. Or oh, I don't know. I just don't, just don't, a, don't know how to do it. You just hold I it do, down? I do it? have, you know, my garden um, kind of. A little plot? Yeah, I don't know if you can see that, but yeah. Blurry, I have blurry. a little grid with all the stuff on there, but it's few and far between. Random doodles. Uh, but, I, don't know, I don't know how y'all as an audience would look at this and pull anything no. particularly helpful out of it. Oh, <laughs> you know, here it's we like go. Just very, here are some, uh, it's, here are some it's very specific to Drew's scenario. Here are some, uh, these are notes for a toy accordion. This is how to play the Muppet show theme. Oh yeah. The, uh, on... o- Ocarina, I think it was called, right? No, no, it's just a toy accordion. Isn't that Ocarina a small accordion? No, Ocarina is like a whistle. It is. It's a. It's a not a whistle, oh, but a, 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 a fluty thing. A fluty thing. It's a blowy so any look, mouth mouth noise thing. Ocarina. So yeah, justice. This is this is this is absolutely. Oh yeah, that's not at all. An accordion. <laughs> I have some plans for my son's Halloween costume last year. That's a th- so it's just a random mess. It's a vessel flute. Anyway, I will an say ocarina. that my 2023 plans <clears throat> include simply journaling regularly. I want to buy a 2023 or you know whatever date. It um, doesn't matter because they're not dated. Uh, five-year journal from Leuchtturm, the some lines a day. I want to do that. And I want to just set aside some time every day to write something, just mm. a, a one sentence. Some by, lines. Just write some lines. That's it. That's the goal. Every day. The goal is not to have a fancy journal. The goal is to achieve a routine. That's all I want. I had a fairly solid some lines a day that I did for about two years. You did two years every day? There's, no, there's some gaps in there. Oh, okay. And then the gaps started to get bigger and More bigger gappy. and then it was yeah. to the point where it was like this isn't really a some yeah. lines a day this is a some lines sometimes and then i did that was years ago at this point i want to see maybe like we need to create five. a new journal that's called some lines sometimes some lines sometimes some lines sometimes <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> that's rescue rangers brian <laughs> i was trying you to place. i was like you got it uh, i made it at first i was like darkwing duck no ah. no that's not it okay all um, right that's it for me um Thank you, Justice, but uh, no, uh, journaling at all is going to be my goal in yeah. journaling. My, my journaling situation is a disaster. My it journaling is nothing goal to, is to have a journal. It's nothing to seek inspiration from. My problem is I, I try to use a lot of different journals so that I can speak of them and have experience with them. But what that means is that I end up having notes that are spread all over the place. And then I they're completely unreferenceable and I lose track of them. And it's very scattered. Yep. Much like my brain. Familiar. Anyway. Um, okay. <clears throat> First off, got to apologize about the mic issues. Apparently, that saga continues. I think we're learning that the problem is me, um, that I gesticulate too much when I talk, and I apparently smack the table, I play with the mic, I do all kinds of incorrect things, and despite being chastised regularly by my team, 
I just can't change who I am, and I like to fiddle with stuff. Nor should you. Um, well, I mean, I don't want the, the good, mic good the folks at home to suffer. So oh. um, we're trying this new arrangement here. We have these mic arms, which we've used in various situations before. The table that we use for shooting this pencast is a little weird, so it's a bit odd in where I have to put it, and it's like kind of blocking where I would normally put my computer. So I don't love this arrangement, but we'll try it. And if you all are like, wow, game-changing audio setup this week, keep this up, then I will take one for the team and I will deal with this. I can tell you are you are nearer me than you normally are. Well, I, I am, yeah. <laughs> Which is fine. It's I either fine. need to be like really near you or I need to be like way because away. Because computer. Because the computer, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so I'm, make, I'm doing my best, making it work, put the, got the pop filter on. Pop, pop. Anyway, yeah. So if this doesn't work, Forget it. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna leave. We'll just let Drew do this on his own because he sounds fine. Um, okay. Uh, this feedback is from Shaza Girl ninety eight oh three. Brian, the story of how you and Rachel met melts my heart, and I wonder if many of your followers all said no, no, at the same podcast time. If there is such a thing as destiny, this is your moment. Very, very cool love story. I agree. I think it's a very cool story. And it's one, it's not lost on me either. I knew like, as it was unfolding, I was like, this is something special. This is this like- is your density. This is my, yeah, <laughs> this is my density. That's right. Um, but anyway, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Anna Strasco 7581 subscribes to Fountain Pen YouTube show. Learns about TIG welding, MIG welding, building roads out of logs, the greater DC area, pillow couches, and corgis. I like that. You yes. Get, uh, well, you, you talk long enough, you're going to learn about all kinds of things. That is what Ann did. She, <laughs> she thought she was going to get one thing, and she got one thing and lots of other things. I mean, we do talk a lot about fountain pens, too, right? We do. We like, do. we try to. About half and half, I'd say. <laughs> Some weeks more than others. Yes. We'll be a little more fountain pen heavy this week, I, I think. Uh, and the last one is from Benzia Zuras. For ink funny names, I thought for sure you guys would mention, mention Sailor Manyo. Ha ha. I mean, it literally says, ha ha. Doesn't get much fun, much more funny. That was just one of those things like it was just hiding in plain sight. We were just, we didn't see it. It was yeah. too obvious. But uh, Manyo, ha ha, that is a funny ink name indeed. I wonder if I could just start saying, ha ha, every time. Sailor instead Manyo, of, ha ha. Instead of, ha ha. Or say it different every time. Sailor Manyo, ha ha. Sailor Manyo, ha ha. Sailor oh, Manyo, see, <laughs> See, that's more of a giggle. That's that not is. A ha -ha. That's, not, that's a hee hee. And that first one was more of a. <laughs> the second one was more of a guffaw. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know all the. I don't know the names of laughs. I'm just being dumb. All right. Uh, uh, okay. Now let's talk about some actual pen stuff. Moving on to our segment for new stuff. All right, Drew. This is a crazy one, Brian. We are. We got all kinds of things happening in the new stuff. This first one, though, man. Hold on to your hats. That's right. Uh, the Visconti Tutankhamen Limited Edition. This pen is pretty epic. The pen is epic. The display is epic. There's a whole lot going on. Uh, so it's, it's commemorating the 100th anniversary of the discovery of King Tutankhamen's tomb. Uh, so it is a, you know, the, the, the style of the pen is not totally dissimilar to what some of Visconti's done on some of their crazy limited editions in the past where they have like an ivory resin with scrimshaw uh, in it. However, they backfill the scrimshaw with enameling. So uh, it's like a colored scrimshaw, which has the designs of some of what you see on the inside of King Tut's tomb. So some meaningful um, artwork there. Uh, it has ceramic fired enameling over vermeil, gold, sterling silver, lots of things happening on this pen. Um, very complex pen to manufacture, I can imagine, extremely time consuming and it looks just amazing. So the like uh, enameling and stuff is made to emulate the jewelry, the necklace and stuff like that, that, uh, that King Tut was wearing. So, uh, and then the, the pen display itself has this like olive wood base with this like gilded sarcophagus with a clear display where you can see the pen. Is it glass or plastic? I don't know, actually. I didn't like tap on it, but think, either way. I think it might be glass. Yeah, it could like be. Like the, the, the Visconti um, Il Magnifico ones. Yeah, those with, are, With yeah. the frame, like yeah, the silver, yeah. those are glass in there. Oh, it's probably glass. Not mm -hmm. like it matters. I don't know why I'm hung up on this. Yeah, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> either way, it looks like nothing else. No. Um, it is very impressive. The only thing that would impress me more is if it came in a box, it was like filled with dirt and you had to like 
excavate it out of the box. That's a good idea. But that would obviously be a total disaster and would, <laughs> you know, not not fare well for the pen itself. But that's about the only thing you could do to make this pen like even more fitting to the theme. So um, I don't think this is going to be a pen for most people. It's wildly impractical as and an everyday writing instrument. Wildly expensive. And it's very expensive. But for a collector item and for a talking piece, uh, it certainly hits that mark. So go check it out. Just go look at the pen, if nothing else, because it's it's wild. It's more affordable than the actual sarcophagus. Well, that's true, as most things probably are. So a bargain, essentially. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, anyway. You know, why do they call him <laughs> King Tut, but the name is Tutu Common? Like, wouldn't it be King Toot? That's a good question. Can we can we commit to doing it's that? There's probably a reason why they didn't go with King Toot. <sighs> I'm just guess. For, <laughs> you looked at me and said that so seriously. You no, know, I'm just. <laughs> I didn't know how serious of a question that was for you, but uh, you know. Uh, okay. Um, moving on. So Sailor, I mean Sailor doesn't come out with a lot of new pens. I know we've been waiting for a while to see one. Oh man, I forgot about uh, <laughs> Sailor. They haven't been doing anything. Uh, but they have another new pen. This is a North American exclusive called Follow the Mermaid, um, which I mean, when you see the pen, you're like. Mm. Yep, if I was gonna make a mermaid, mermaid themed pen, that would do it. So it's a uh, in the Pro Gear and Pro Gear Slim body style. Um, it's got a sparkling lilac body, blue green cap and section, white finials. It's got a bicolor nib, which I'm a big fan of. Yes, those bicolor nibs. Absolutely, they look so good. It's got all seven standard nib sizes for Sailor, and it just looks really nice. So you can go check that out. We've got it. Uh, I think we just launched it what this week, right? So, yeah. Um, um, I know that right? I uh, yeah. promoted it today, yeah. so Wednesday. I think we just, yeah. The Tuesday. A couple days ago. What day is it? I don't know. It's Tuesday in f filming land. It's Friday when this goes out. And it could be later when you actually watch this. Who knows? Um, anyway, so go check that out. It's pretty cool. And then last one I have. Uh, nope, not talking about those because they're not here yet. So never mind. We have more pens that I'm going to talk about <laughs> in the future when we have are ready for them. What do you got, Drew? A new swipe, Brian. A new hey. Tvisby swipe. This one looks good. This one looks really good. It this is, is the best swipe. Ice blue. Best swipe of the bunch, I gotta say. You might be right. I am you right. You might be right. Oh, I, the, this the, isn't for debate. The Prussian blue this looks is, this good. This is a statement of fact. But I, I do think that this one is a little bit better. If the Prussian mm -hmm. blue had the translucency that this new ice blue has, that might win. But the okay. translucency, like it does give you that ice blue vibe. It looks like ice. It is very much a winter yeah. vibey pen. Oh, yeah. But if you love the Twisby swipe, this one, or if you've you know been waiting for a color that speaks to you, this might be the color. You know what kind of reminds me of, Drew? It reminds uh, me of uh, Batman Forever mm -hmm. when you had uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger as that, Mr. Mr. Freeze. That was Batman and Robin. Oh, you're right. That was Forever not, was Two Face and Riddler. That's right. That's right. Okay, you're right. But uh, they were both Clooney, right? No, one was Kilmer. Oh, that's Forever right. was Kilmer. Forever was Kilmer. Clooney only had one movie. Man, see, I don't. I gotta get. I gotta get current on my stuff, Drew. I'm you out don't of, need to. I'm out of sorts. I'm sure that you remember them fondly than you would if you watched them now. Probably. I remember the Batman Forever soundtrack. That thing was oh, on point. Got some seal on the there. The music, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was very nice. Rose, that song was. Yep. That was yeah. That was good. So yeah, that reminds, that reminds you of Mr. Freeze's suit. Mr. Freeze, yeah. Let okay. me just get. I didn't like look it up. Let me just refresh myself. Yeah, it's pretty fitting. I mean, the blue is slightly different, but it does kind of remind me of. Yeah, that, I can see that. Yeah, I can see that. It just so yeah, all the bad puns. Yeah, it's pretty. I mean, that's look at his yeah. face. That's pretty. That's pretty. Pretty Mr. Freeze. Pretty dead on. Yeah. yeah. So it's a good icy pen. It's the you know other than the color, it's the same same swipe, which is a good thing. Let's kick some ice. Oh my God. Wasn't his, that in line in that movie? Puns, he had like so, bad. so many bad puns. So bad. It was so painful. <laughs> Batman had like a credit wow. card that said Batman on it. Like <laughs> never leave the home without it. Wow. Garbage, garbage film. Isn't he supposed to like have a hidden lair? Wouldn't you need like a home address to get a credit card I, with your alternate identity on it? There are many things to take issue with in that <laughs> film. Um, that car was sweet though. That it lit up. It was yes. stupid. It shot no. like a twenty foot flame out of the back of it. And uh, the original was one was awesome. Uh, the Michael Keaton car that was the best. No, I like that. The other Val, one, that like Val Kilmer one. Oh. it was like thirty feet long. You're like, how does that turn? How does it that thing make a turn? It doesn't. It's ridiculous, <laughs> but it was awesome. Anyway, fountain pens. <laughs> uh, Twisby swipe. It's out now. Grab it. Also out now will be the Jinhao X159. We have the old, not X159 in stock, and that is just a. Brass Jinhao, little beefy, number six nib, 
But the X159 is a plastic barrel pen mm -hmm. with a number eight Some other slight differences. Nib. So this is the same thing, but also not at all the same mm -hmm. thing. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. redefine what you think the 159 is, because this is new stuff, and we'll have more on that later. But it's out now. Grab it if you want it. And then finally, also, this should be out by the time this airs. At $68, there is a new Monteverde Innova available. So the Innova was the uh, was first launched a couple years ago to commemorate Monteverde's 20th anniversary. And it was done in carbon fiber and rose gold. Came out in a couple different finishes after that. Very affordable pen for what you're getting. This newest one, though, is uh, not carbon fiber. It is a uh, metal weave. So it's a um, uh, the, the M... Pro the Formula M, uh, what is it? the M could stand for mesh, probably, possibly. It's like or a Monteverde. It's like a metal mesh. Um, I would call it a weave more than a mesh, I guess. Right? Same I mean, thing. Is mesh a weave? Meshes are weaved, right? Yeah, it's one of those, but it, it's not lacquered. It is. You will feel that mesh. So it's a very tactile right. pen. If woven. you like that, woven. Yes. Woven, not weaved. I don't well, think weaved is. No, a, it's not. That's not a word. Weaved. No. Weave, weaved woven. in and out. Woven. If a car is. <clears throat> If a car weaved in between we traffic? Weaves, weaving, wove, woves. What? That's not right. Car can't woven between wo traffic. Wo weaving. We you're weaving in and out. Have you weaved? No, you've woven. Wow, I this really car, don't. This car wove in between other cars? I genuinely don't know what, <laughs> all of it sounds wrong. I, I None know, of this sounds no, right. I said it too many times. <laughs> weaved. Yeah. Weaved. Weaved. Car, the car weaved in and out of traffic. Or yeah, did, I guess I've used that. Woved. It wove. No, that doesn't mean that's not a word. That's not a word. It wo right, wove. Anyway, that, wove. That's available as well. The Innova uh, at sixty-eight dollars. It's a pretty solidly priced pen for what you're getting. Yeah, this is definitely the first metal woven pen that I have seen. Weaved. <laughs> All right. Wait, uh, what is the past sense of weave? I'm sorry. I'm like super tangent today. Past sense of weave. Oh, what in the world? No, oh. I don't know what I'm gonna find. You keep going. A wove. Weave. Wove is a usual past oh. tense. And woven, the usual past tense. He wove a basket. So weaved is not a word. She weaves cloth on her loom. Okay. Weaved. Oh, is that a thing? Past tense verb to weave. Okay. I, I, anyway. I think you can use either. Maybe. Maybe that's why they all sound Colloquial. acceptable. Oh, grammar monster. Okay, let's see. Sorry, you go ahead, Drew. Uh, no, no, we're I'll done. We're ready out. for Q&A now. Oh, okay. Well, then forget this. Y'all can look it up. You probably already said it in the comments. We're just being dumb. Now let's move on to Q&A. Okay. Our first question for this week comes to it. us from JoLynn. All right. And JoLynn is asking you, Brian, because you, this will become clear here in a moment. Okay. Can you talk about storage for mm. your pens and the most functional way to store all of your pens? I have about 100 plus pens, both vintage and modern in my collection, which desperately need a scrub down and a Drule toothbrush. I would like to find a, a functional system that allows me to move pens in and out with ease and can be put up safely from tiny fingers. I have two kids under two, so it's important that Ooh. they aren't displayed in the open. Fair what enough. kind of cases do you recommend that can hold a large volume of pen? Brian, being someone mm. that does in fact possess a large volume of pens, mm -hmm. what are you going to advise Joe Lynn on? I have not only had varying degrees of volumes of pens. You've had varying degrees I've, of children. I've had I have had varying <laughs> degrees of tiny fingers yes. as well to keep said pens from said fingers. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, so I've had a couple different ways that this process has evolved for me personally. Um, I, of course, am not your normal situation, <laughs> not your normal situation uh, for pen storage because I'm Obviously, in this business, I've been in it for 13 years plus. So a lot of, I have a lot of pens, way more than your average person would ever reasonably have. But basically, what I've done is I've like scaled my my pen system and just like duplicated the storage unit that I have. And just the more pens I have, just the more units I will end up getting. So I feel like the answer that I have to this is still fairly applicable to your situation yeah. here, Jolyn. So um, we don't sell something that stores that much of capacity. You know, we sell some pen storage options, but most of the people that are looking for pen storage things from us are, you know, people storing pens to carry around with them in like a practical sense, not so much for like display purposes or like long-term storage kind of cataloging type things. So we don't sell 
things that approach the realm of like furniture that you would store pens in, you know, that kind of a thing. And like, our shipping department would love it if we did. I'm sure they would. They would just love it. Um, so we don't do that kind of stuff, but um, there are some options out there for that kind of a thing. But when you're getting into like the 100 plus pen range, there really isn't a lot of options for like commercially made 100 plus pen storage units because that's a pretty specific storage need. Um, so what I started out doing when I when my pen collection was kind of ever growing is I just had like multiple large pen cases and I would store things in cases, which worked okay for a while, especially if you have like somewhat of a theme or a grouping to your pens. You know, if you have pens that you like to carry around with you and use all the time, keeping that in one case, you have other ones that are like, you know, a certain collection. So you have like a Lamy Safari collection or whatever, you know, and you wanna keep all those pens in one case. That can work, but I found that, you know, that's hard to like find things that fit that cleanly into different cases. And then for me personally, I am a very visual person in terms of my personal organization, um, which ultimately means I have clutter everywhere because if I don't see it, I forget I have it or I need to find it. I dig it out of a drawer and then I leave it on the desk and then it just stays there. So uh, me personally, if I can't like see it easily, then I end up just like rifling through case after case after case. And that's ultimately what ended up happening. What I found once, you know, I'd used like the Monteverde 36 pen case, you know, that at the time I think was like one of the bigger pen cases that we had. At the time it was, it was the biggest. It yeah, was this the was biggest until we got eight, Girologio. Yeah, eight years ago or so maybe that was one of the biggest and most most affordable. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, that is one option that, um, so I have like some specific products that we sell to recommend. Um, the biggest one they currently have is a Girologio 48 pen case, which is $90, which the the dollar per pen storage bang for your buck on that one is pretty good. Um, we used to sell the 96 pen case, which I have a couple of those, yep. which I do enjoy, but I, I will admit it's, it's a bit much. It's like a pen briefcase that unfolds and trying to find something out of there is no more convenient than just multiplying your 48 pen cases, honestly. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's a bit much. Just to, consolidated. Yeah, so it wasn't super popular, so we don't carry it anymore because they just didn't sell that great. But the other ones, you know, the 48 pen case still does okay. Um, the Galen Leather has a 40 slot pen case. That's I love that 95 case. bucks. Those are, and the, like the quality of those is markedly higher than the Girologio. Yeah. So Girologio, higher bang for the buck, and it's still like decent quality, it's still leather. Yeah. Like it's still holds up, but the fit and finish on that is not the same. Yeah. The, the leather's the, not as supple. The 40 like pen case from Galen has that beautiful binding. It looks like on a bookshelf. It looks like a book. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. It's yeah, especially if you're going to have multiples of those and you want to store them up on a bookshelf where maybe little hands wouldn't, it'd almost be kind of covert. Like they wouldn't know what's there. Yeah. You know? Um, so if you store it up out of sight uh, or out of, out of reaching range, it could be a good option for you. You know, but those 40 slot pen cases, they're 95 bucks. So really not a lot more expensive than the Girologio ones. Uh, the Monteverde 36 pen case, that's a non-leather option. So if you are not a fan of leather products, that could be good. That's 40 bucks. Um, and then Aston leather, they're good quality leather too. That the, the biggest they have though is a 20 slot and that's 98 bucks. So not as much bang for the buck, but that one's, that one I like for carrying around. It's, you know, it's a good carry around case, but there's other smaller options with both Geologio and Galen as well. Um, so that that worked for me for a while. Like I had a couple of years there where keeping pens in cases worked pretty okay. I did have one situation where I had, like I had an old desk in my old office. This was like the previous building, mm -hmm. but the drawers in that desk were like made for hanging file folders. Mm -hmm. So like the drawers didn't go all the way up to like the top. So like the sides of the drawer only went up about halfway and then it had like a wire rack kind of thing for yeah. holding hanging drawers. So what happened is I was like stacking all of my pen cases like inside that drawer, but like one of them slipped out and behind the drawer. So I, I basically like lost like 36 pens and it took me a couple of weeks I think until I finally figured out what had happened. It just slid and fell back. So very specific scenario to me. You're probably not gonna run into that, but that's maybe some of the downside of having things in multiple cases is you need to keep track of those cases and you need to, um, you know, if you're gonna keep them away and that, that's part of why I kept them there is because we had our kids in the office at the time. They would come in and grab all kinds of things all the time. So I wanted to have my pens that I knew were kind of safe and put away. Little did I know that where I was storing them was uh, the biggest threat to my keeping them Precarious. safe. Precarious. It's all fine, I recovered them, but anyway, um, so, 
what I what I ultimately decided on once I got to the point where I was, you know, I think I was at well over 100 pens at that point, um, was I wanted a more of that like furniture style thing. Um, did all kinds of research. There was really no out of the box kind of option um, out or off the shelf option or whatever the heck you want to call it. Um, I mean, there were some like larger pen display things. I want to say like Venlo or something maybe it was like a display case company that had some like pen options or something, but it was like $1,700 and it held like 80 pens or something. It was more for like fancy wood, glass top, like mm. that kind of a thing. I was like, that's really not what I'm going for here. And that price was not at all what I was looking for. So I wanted something fairly economical and just very practical. So um, I've talked about it before and I've shown it in various forms. We've shown it in, in some previous videos. Um, and maybe we can throw up a few pictures here or whatever. But basically I, I found a piece of furniture from Ikea um, and we have no affiliation with them, make nothing off of this recommendation, but um, they have a piece of furniture. Essentially, it's like a shallow drawer unit. Um, the drawers are maybe four inches tall, somewhere thereabouts, which is just perfect for like storing, you know, pens in like a tray fashion. Um, so I bought that unit, it's called the Alex. They have several different like sizes of that one, but this is like the 26 inch by 26 inch basically cube um, that has, oh, I wanna say six drawers in it. And uh, it works really well if you get um, these like slotted, um, what are they called? Slotted display inserts. So it's pretty, it's it's a item that you find more in like the jewelry, kind of like jewelry display world. Um, so essentially they're like plastic molded trays with a felt lining on mm -hmm. it that have like these little like slots in them that you yeah. can store. You know, I think they do them a lot for like when you have rings, when you're trying to display rings on like, you know, that like, tube type yeah. thing and you have rings on them and you lay them down in there. That's what jewelry stores use them for. But I mean, it works great for pens too. So if you just Google, you know, slotted display inserts or tray insert, jewelry tray inserts, ring inserts, you know, that type of thing, you'll find something similar. Some companies might even sell them under pen inserts. Yeah, like yeah. I found one, I, I think, I don't know if the company that I bought it from even sells it anymore, which is why I'm not giving like a specific name. Um, but anyway, I had to source a bunch of those out. Um, so I basically bought those like slotted insert tray things and it really fit kind of well where two of those trays would fit depth wise in one of those drawers. Right. And then I would just cut the trays to fit you know, the the width of drawer. And I think in one of those units, I was able to fit something like 250 to maybe 300 pens, you know, and that's not even like stacking trays within the drawers, which you could do if you really wanted to. Um, but if you just wanted easy access to all those things. Now it's not a locking cabinet or anything like that. So, you know, for little hands, you may need to rig up your own locking system. Um, but that is something that's pretty off the shelf. I think that unit's like 150 bucks. Um, I think it was a hundred bucks at the time that I bought it. It's gone up in price as everything has probably yes. in the last like 10 years. Um, so, but pretty economical option. It's a couple hundred buck investment between that and the slotted trays. But for the number of pens at stores, it's pretty tough to beat. Um, so, and now I have more pens than that. So I have multiple of them and they stack nicely and that kind of thing. So that's been a great solution for me uh, over time. Um, but there are some other creative things I've seen people in the community do. I've seen people that have found like old cartography, like furniture, like where they, you know, map displays and stuff like that. And, and there's certain, you know, things like that that are like, I don't know, trays made for like dental equipment and, you know, hmm. things, think of anything that you store Cigar cases, that's like, probably. yeah, like anything you store that's, you know, kind of flat yeah. and long, like that type of furniture could work really well. And there's a lot of people I know who will find them on Craigslist or eBay or that kind of a thing. They'll repurpose them, refurbish them, whatever. That can be kind of a fun project too. Um, and you can turn that into the thing. Um, tool chests as well. You think oh, about right. like mechanics chests mm -hmm. or like tool boxes. You can find those pretty easily, new or used. Those can work pretty well, especially with some of those pen trays. Bit of a different vibe. I'm not sure if you want a mechanics chest in your like home office. I mean, maybe you do. I mean, it's, I think it's a pretty cool vibe, but um, you know, would work really well, roller bearing drawers, that kind of a thing. So basically anything with shallow drawers, you're gonna be able to get pretty economically to store some pens. Um, so, uh, and some of those might even have locking mechanisms on them. So that could be a major plus of looking for that type of furniture. So um, those are my recommendations. That's what I got for you, so. Yeah, that, that hits the nail on the head. I think the only one that I would recommend looking at as well is a company called Toyoka Craft. They are out of Japan and mm. they make some really sought after uh, handmade wooden pen cases, specifically for pens. And uh, 
They're a little bit hard to get, but uh, okay, they're, yeah. they usually are at the San Francisco Pen Show, and uh, you can order them. But yeah, these are like more along the lines of those like display. Yeah, the one of... that I see the most is a uh, 100 pen case. They also have a, have a 40 as well. So if you're looking for right at 100, I know that in this case, Jolyn says she has a little bit more than 100. Uh, probably mm -hmm. wouldn't help Jolyn, but uh, if you if you have 100 or fewer, this is a good, you know, kind of 50 to 100 dollar range. Uh, they're really well received, good craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, nice this is like a little higher quality of a display item than yeah, like an IKEA yeah. piece of furniture. Absolutely. But uh, people cool. really like those within the fountain pen community. So, you know, you check them out on Instagram and stuff, at least envy them as I do. <laughs> nice. Oh, that's cool. They got some like ink bottle display. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool too. company. I, I wish I had one. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, all right. <laughs> Very great. Cool. All right. Next question we got. This one's for you, Drew. This is from Ryuku21. What are your favorite fountain pens of each filling mechanism type? Also, which filling mechanism is the best? And I guess this answer is just for Drew. Since I asked the question, you get to answer it and I will uh, not answer anything, right? Because I don't, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to skirt out of answering the Oh, no, you'll be fine. In myself. fact, you had your notes in here before. I did. Like, you know how sometimes I have mine in there and you're like, mm -hmm. oh man, I think Drew influenced me a little bit. 100%, like I'm having to avoid saying the same things you already said. Oh, yeah? And I'm questioning myself, like, do I actually feel the same way or am I only saying this because his notes are right there? Ooh. So I don't know. But okay. Okay. so, Cartridge converter is my favorite type of filling mechanism. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not, I don't need capacity. I like to change my inks out often. So mm. a big capacity does not interest me. There's a novelty there for vacuum filling, I guess, but I don't, I don't really, that's not a factor for me. So cartridge mm. converter, honestly, refilling cartridges are just fine for me as well if the converters give me a hard time. So cartridge converter, my favorite. My favorite cartridge converter pen is my favorite pen, the Pilot Custom 912. So, mm. uh, I just picked my favorite pen and it happened to be a cartridge converter pen. So there I you mean, go. That makes sense. Uh, my favorite piston, internal piston mechanism is the Twisby 580. I, mm. um, like Brian already typed in, I, I'm giving it extra points for its disassembly, 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 disassemblability. Yikes. We've woven. We can't woven speak woved. today. <laughs> it's ability to be disassembled. There you go. It's user service ability. <clears throat> yeah. I, I value piece. that a lot. I can. And I also, if I want a piston pen, I'd like to be able to see it ideally. Mm. Um, I don't know, because I'm going to be a hypocrite because I don't need to see my vacuum pen apparently. But I do like the ability of the user service uh, asset that Twisby pens have. So that's going to be my favorite piston pen. Vacuum filling pen though. Um, I will say that the VAC 700 I don't love that one because of the the wide step. The grip is not super comfortable to me. Mm. And the uh, Visconti Homo Sapiens has to test to take the crown on this one for that's, me. That's a very solid pen. It yeah. is. And then also the Divina. I'm a big fan of the vacuum filling Divina. I, a lot of the mm. uh, Divinas are, have a captured converter in there. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm um, trying to think of the mine, vacuum filling. My, my Desert Springs Divina, the uh, celluloid one that has a... That might be the only one that is... I love it. I love it. It's That's got vacuum filling. Mm -hmm. You you pull it. You pull the thing out. You press it vacuum, and then you kind of like can thunk the button to kind of make the button shallow. It's super cool. Huh? Yeah, I like it a lot. So did not realize that. It's one of my favorite pens. Um, that is pretty and, rare. Uh, so yeah, it's probably my favorite vacuum filling pen. Okay. And then eyedropper, I rarely, very rarely use eyedroppers because again, capacity is basically the only reason to mm. use an eyedropper. There's no other benefit to using an eyedropper other than capacity. In fact, that it is comes- That's the main reason, yeah. What other possible, that is the only. I mean, simplicity would be one. You don't have to worry about cartridges or converters or anything. It's just, it's the simplest filling simplest, mechanism but it, it, you can it, It's find. also complicated with its issues and problems. I mean, like it, who doesn't have problems? <laughs> I think it's more trouble than it's worth, personally. So I don't deal mm. with it. But I will have to say that I think the Preppy is probably my favorite, simply because mm. you can get that eyedropper ability. You can get that crazy high capacity at a really affordable price point, And you mm. can kind of modify. Is that yourself. an eyedropper pen, though? It's a cartridge converter pen. You're I guess it is. You're converting it to an it? eyedropper. I guess it's as much a it's I mean, as much an eyedropper pen as it is a converter pen. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's right? a uh, yeah. I guess if you're converting it to a converter, you can convert it to an eyedropper. But right? Yeah, I mean really, if you're talking strictly eyedropper pens, there's like two to choose. There's from. not that many that are yeah only basically designed to be Opus eyedropper. Opus eighty eight, Diplomat Nexus, Namiki Emperor. 
there's probably others that I'm failing to think of, but that might be that I might don't be. Think it's that pretty we, limited, I don't think pretty that we limited carry pool, them. Pretty limited yeah. pool. I think as far as ones that we sell that are strictly eyedropper only, I think it's just those three. Okay. So prior to last week, it was only two. Well, okay. So that's my list. Fair enough. See now it looks like I'm copying, copying you. Yeah, no, no, because... you had your nose in here first. <laughs> um, cartridge converter. Honestly, there's too many options. I, I'm mm-hmm. having a hard time deciding because it's no, me too. It's like the bulk of pens. I mean, right? I just picked my favorite pen. Yeah, I mean, Pilot Custom Seventy Four is a very solid choice for me. So yeah. I think that would be my favorite cartridge converter. I do like the Con Seventy converter. You get a high end capacity. You do get a high end capacity once it is you fill a, it with a syringe. It is a more. <laughs> You just barely have problems <laughs> that I don't have filling that converter. I, I, it is a complicated converter. It's, it's but, fine. No, I do know how to fill it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you, yeah I have a video on how to fill it. I, I do. Know. It's, it's really good. It's more complicated. Um, than it needs check to it be. out. Well, you know, the best things in life are complicated, aren't they? <laughs> That's not an expression. I just made that up. <laughs> That's called justification. Um, piston pen. This was tough. The Eco or the 580 is up there. I do love. The user serviceability aspect of it, the disassemblability of it. However, the Lamy 2000 is a very solid choice. So for making it different than your choice, I'm going to go Lamy 2000 because it is a great piston pen. Absolutely. Um, Vacuum pen, Pilot Custom 823 is a very solid choice. All around, I like that pen. I do like... I mean, you you can disassemble that one, but I always feel like I'm flirting with danger when yes. I do that because Pilot just really drives it home that they don't want people messing that pen. Yeah, and it's, it's um, like working in customer care too. Like you, you see cracked 823s it, far too often. It happens from time to time. Yeah. It's not like it happens all the time. But don't, it's don't the, get freaked out. No, no, no. But, well, in, but, in, in 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 that um, in that job in that role. Well, like, your your job that is going to gravitate. Your job is to you. deal with exactly. The so yeah. so you can't help but kind of like. It's just like being a nurse or something. If you right. see a lot of medical issues, like in your personal life, you be like, "Oh my god, this could be that. This could be that. This could be that." You know, one little oh, mark yeah. on your skin, you're like, "Oh my god, I'm gonna die." Yeah. So my, it just my gets, mom was an X-ray technician, and it was driven into me like you're never riding a motorcycle. Right. Like that. It was something that was never yes. on the table. So now for me as a kid, there yeah. are definitely pens that I'm like scared <laughs> of just because of working in that department. Okay, fair enough. For no fair good enough. reason other than just you know association. But it's a great pen. I love that Absolutely. pen. Absolutely. But I mean, for a, I'm also a tinkerer. So in terms of like tinkerability and just taking my parts pen all the time, th- it's tough to beat a Twisby. So that one's also very solid. But if I, I think if I had to pick one, I w- it was an all around like enjoyable, usable pen experience. The A23 is is pretty tough to beat. Amazing on vacuum pen. pens. Eyedropper, I went, what the heck? I just said Namiki Emperor. I mean, it's the best. I don't have one. I don't own one personally, but you know. You don't own an Emperor yet. I can, because they're really expensive. Still, even ten, the cheap ones. Ten, 10 plus years, you think that one would just have happened to you. I was trying, I was trying to get my hands on a uh, Namiki Emperor Moonlight Rodden. Okay, don't shoot for the stars or anything. I mean, if I'm going to get an emperor, that would be the one. I mean, yeah, I guess. But, like, they're impossible yes. to find. Oh, absolutely. Impossible. And it would have been crazy expensive. Not even justifiable. Oh, yeah. But it didn't even, I, it, what, the, the offer didn't even That'd really happen. That'd be like the price happen. of a car. Yeah, it was like a personal contact who I was trying to get it through, oh, and it man. never panned out anyway. Oh. So I never had to get to the point where I was seriously talking with justifying oh, the price of it. But anyway. I mean, if I'm dreaming, right? Like, no, let's go sure. with that one. Dream big. That way, if I'm going to have an eyedropper pen, let's make it a Namiki Emperor Moonlight. Why not? Um, but yeah, there you go. Which felling mechanism is the best? For me, it just all around, I, I would have to go cartridge converter like you. Like Versatility. You have so many different options. Ease of use. You have so many so many different choices in terms of ways that you can fill it, you know, and that kind They're of thing. They're generally easier to clean, too. Um, yeah. A yeah, lot like with, with Twisby, yes, you can take all those apart, but... Other piston pens, vacuum pens, mm-hmm. uh, user I mean, serviceability is not at the forefront of their designing even, principles. Even with a Twisby, you still need like the wrench to yeah. get it off of there, and you know, like with the vacuum, any vacuum with, with the eight twenty three, I love that pen, but it's so hard to get completely clean. Every time you pump that uh, vacuum after you've done it, you get yeah. that spritz, and it has a color tinge to it. And if you're like me, it just drives you nuts. I need it all gone, mm. and. Uh, you know, you could pull the nib and feed and get a syringe in there and just start blasting, but it's nice to be able to take it apart. Yeah, I hear or you. Or just stick with cartridge convert. Yeah. I mean, at least if you have a pen like, I mean, you can do this with the A23, 
which is not as recommended, obviously, but, um, you know, any of the Twisby pins, you can remove the mechanism, whether it's a piston or vacuum. You can remove that off the back and you can just flush the pen out just like you would a cartridge converter with a bulb syringe. A bulb syringe is a total game changer for cleaning any pen that can accept it. 100%. So uh, that to me, like the cartridge converter, especially if you use a lot of different types of ink and you're changing it all the time, that is that is a total game changer. Before you, buy a fountain, before you buy a fountain pen, buy a bulb syringe and just be like, okay, what will this fit? <laughs> that should be your second. Or step one, so you're interested yeah. in buying a fountain pen. Step one, buy a bulb syringe. Step two, find a fountain yes. pen that'll fit it. Yeah, or you might already That's have it. a bulb syringe if you've had a child. <laughs> no, don't use that one. And uh, yeah, don't you, use you may not want to use the one that you suck boogers <laughs> up in, but sterilize it and then use it and you'll be fine. Oh, it's, or, or we sell them for like six bucks. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's a very affordable object. <laughs> um, anyway. All right, there you go. All so right. Let us know what y'all think in the comments too. This is a good, uh, that's a good question that any of us can answer. Uh, next one. Number three from Puneet okay. says, Hi, Brian and Drew. Loving the pen cast. As always, I have a question for you today. Okay. Why is the blind cap on some piston fillers and other pens, presumably, called blind cap? That is a great question. Now, Brian, please help me because I have heard people call many things blind cap yeah? so much that hmm. I'm questioning what is even a blind cap. Oh, well, I hope to answer that for you, but I will say like, I'm not the end all be all historical reference on all fountain pen terminology. <gasps> I've tried to do some research and stuff and I think I have a pretty solid understanding. I right, lay it on us. But it, it, it could be up for debate as to whether a particular design of something is actually called a blind cap. Mm. There's no like regulatory body that says this is what you can call a blind cap and this is what you can't. I mean, I bet it's the same people that decide what a flex nib is. Yeah, or what ink is blue black. Mm -hmm. Is that just a navy ink? Does it have to be an oxidizing iron gall ink that starts blue and turns black? What do you do with that? Mm. What about washable blue ink? Mm. Is that a particular shade? What is waterproof? Oh, okay. So <laughs> there's a lot of things what nibs are flex nibs? There's a lot of things in the fountain pen world. How about standard international converters that are all kind of different? So there's a lot of things in the fountain pen world because it's an enthusiast-driven, non-regulatory bodied it's like know, the wild west. thing. It, it is a little bit. It's more like sort of the community and the market dictates what's generally acceptably called things. And, you know, there's all kinds of things that naturally evolve in the lingo and over time, things get called random things, and sometimes it sticks, and sometimes it doesn't. And I mean, sometimes, we couldn't even decide whether or not the giant promotional Lamy statue had a cap or not. Exactly, right? Like, it's up for debate. <laughs> it's up for debate. So um, you get to work it out for you here. I mean, I think we decided. I was right, and you were just mistaken. That's not the so way I remember I think it. now you have a better understanding <laughs> of that now that I explained it to you. But um, So the blind cap, from my understanding, is when you have some sort of filling mechanism inside the pen, and then whatever the filler knob is for that pen has a cap that goes over top of it so that it is then covered up. That's what I always thought. That's my understanding of a blind cap. But I'd heard people say, like, unscrew the VAC 700's blind cap. And I'm like, that's not a cap. That's it's, just that's a the knob. Filler, that's the filler knob, yeah. It's okay. Not, it's, it, yeah, it's the filler knob, but it's not blind because there's nothing covering it. Right, there's okay. No, there's that, no aspect of being blind, covered, being, like, okay. not. it's exposed. That like, makes so sense to me. Yeah, uh, that's okay. no different than any piston pen that you just unscrew the back and there you go. Yeah. I could see maybe a little bit more of an argument or it's up for interpretation pen like the Lamy 2000 or maybe a Namiki Emperor or something where the filler knob is like so tight and fitted and streamlined mm -hmm. into the pen that it's like camouflaged. You mm -hmm. can't even see it, but it's still exposed. So I could see where some people might interpret that as a blind cap but because it's not really a you, cap. Can't, you can't see the cap. Like a right. cap is covering something. That's my understanding of the terminology. And removable. Is that it needs to be a removable yeah. cap that's covering something up. Otherwise it's just a knob, just a spinny knob. Right. So that's my understanding of what, what is a blind cap. But I did a little bit of Googling. I looked on you know some other sites that have a little, what I would consider to be a little more credibility in terms of like historical pens, like Richard Binder's pens. Rich, you know, his site, richardspens.com, looked on there. Didn't have like a lot of detailed history from what I was able to see about like, where did the terminology of blind cap come from? I even looked on the US Patent and Trademark Office website for the terms blind cap. I found a lot of things about window blinds. I found a lot, <laughs> <laughs> I found a lot of things about uh, hunting blinds. 
Oh. And, uh, and various caps for like bottles and equipment and, and apparel and things like that. But I found nothing blind cap related to a, a pen. So again, I think it's it's kind of an obscure thing. We with, get an A with for most found, found pens. Thank you. I, I really tried, y'all. I really tried to do some research on this. And I'm sorry I did come up pretty dry. But uh, all I really have to speak on is my understanding from just talking to a lot of people and seeing a lot of pens in this industry. So for whatever authority that's worth to you, um, it's my best understanding that the blind cap is a cap that screws on to the back of a pen that covers the filler knob for usually either a piston, perhaps a piston converter or or. I don't. I don't even think a vacuum pen that so I can think of has a blind cap. Actually, do that anymore. It's not common. It's we not don't really actually. The only pen that we have on our site currently that has that is the Noodler's Conrad. Yeah, that has a blind cap. It's a cap that covers a knob. It's a cap that covers the piston knob. Right. Okay. So there's a blind cap. There's a modern example of a blind cap. Um, do you remember the uh, Delta used to have something? I think it was Delta had something like called the Converter Plus, where it was basically like a blind cap that that removed off the back of the pen that had one of those like fancy converters yes, with like think, the metal back to I it. I think that some Mayora or Natunos do that. Yeah, too. yeah, which is like, you know, similar similar uh, founder maker uh, mm-hmm. that did that. So that's, that's a situation where I've seen it on a converter. So you can use a cartridge or converter on there. The, the cap still unscrews off the back, but it's not- So that's a blind it's cap. It's not covering, that's, I would consider that to yeah, be a blind cap because it's still covering the filling knob for the, the and mechanism. It's, and it's an actual cap. And it's an actual cap. It's yeah. removable off the pen. So those are the situations where I can recall them. I There's other vintage pens that I know have blind caps. I don't, I can't think of, I know the, um, what is it, the Schaefer Snorkel maybe? Maybe that was built in though. There's other blind caps. It was a little bit more of a vintage thing. It's not common in today's designs to have no. that. I think just the better, the technology is better and the materials are stronger and stuff like that where, you know, it's just not really necessary. So it's kind of a design element. And also the the, the ones that just give you access to the converter, like I don't see the... You can just real, unscrew the body right. of the pen. It's, you're yeah. just doing the same motion with your fingers. You're just... Yeah. Do you unscrew thing it A was, or it's thing a no- B? I think it's kind of a novelty, you know? It really is. I personally just not have the novelty and pay a little bit less for the pen. So, I mean, the argument I could make with the converter thing is sometimes, you know, with a standard international converter, if it's not threaded, you know, some are some are threaded, but if it's not threaded, you're kind of like banking on just the grip of that little con- end of the converter holding the pen on when you're mm-hmm. going to fill it. Whereas if you have the, if you have, they're holding the body of the pen, there's nothing to fall off, right? There's, you're not going to lose anything in the bottle of the, the, you know, so you still get to unscrew the, so, I mean, but it's like, more to hold on to, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're sort of like solving a problem that doesn't really all exist right, that much. All right. So an argument could be made, but you also just have a converter that fits on well and yeah. then it wouldn't be a concern. Yeah. So that's about the only thing that I can really think would be beneficial there. But, um, you know, so I think that uh, it's not, again, it's not very common. I was going to say the main advantage to a blind cap is it, I guess it protects the filler knob from maybe being unintentionally twisted when it's being handled or if you have it in your pocket or whatever. I don't think that happens. Or it might a just lot, be an aesthetic thing. But yeah, like, I think largely it's knobs an aesthetic. are knobs are not as attractive as a nice uh, flush, you know, extension of the barrel. I guess, but you can also design a knob to be flush. I think that's the direction they went. So I, you know, like the like the twi- like the five eighty for example, like that yeah. knob is a very flush, congruent piece of the pen. I think it, to me it kind of falls in with something like a like a lever filler. Mm-hmm. Like lever filler was a technology that existed at the time that it did. It served a purpose for what it was doing. But as soon as better technology came around, it wasn't really necessary anymore. And so there are vintage pens that have, you know, that aspect aspect to it. And there may be a throwback every now and then in a redesign that that has that as a novelty but it's not really required anymore. Yeah. I would say that blind caps kind of fall into that same category, which is why you don't see a lot of them anymore. I think that's about right. But I mean, probably a lot of people still call them blind caps because I guess in their placement and in their, you know, somewhat of their functionality, it's similar to like you would have as a filler knob on a vacuum pen or something. So I guess people are considering like it's a knob that somewhat feels removable because you're pulling it out so far from a vacuum filling pen. Mm-hmm. You know, I can, I can see, I wouldn't like chastise anybody but I, I believe the blind aspect to it is it's actually being, co- you know, it's like covering yeah. the filling mechanism. Yeah, the that sounds about right. Yeah. That's my best guess. All right. No, that I could good. Be, I could be wrong, but that's my best understanding. That and I found good. nothing in my research to dispute that understanding or confirm it, really, because there's not much out there, which I guess is why we get asked that question. So 
let's just go with that. I was I was actually just talking with uh, Ethan earlier today. We were talking about uh, converters and like standard international and how it's sort of standard, but not necessarily standard because he was looking at the swipe. And it's like, oh yeah, that's standard international that really only fits the swipe, you know? So we were talking about like, we need to, we need to like start like the global authority body on fountain pen, like terminology and stuff like that. Cause like some, 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 so, you know, it's like so confusing, all these different terms, all these different yeah. things. I was like, let's just, let's just do it. Let's just become the authority and yeah. just dictate that. And uh, we're not actually going to do that, but I was like, it would be nice you if know, it's that kinda, happened. It's, it's kind of like uh, the term pocketbook. You know, now it's mm. some people call purses pocketbooks, even though we, they absolutely do not fit in pockets. What is the difference of a pocketbook? Well, I think no, I think a pocketbook at one point probably did fit in a pocket. At long, huh. olden days, it probably was a small I wa- it was like wallet a size purse that like had pockets in it. Or no, like- no, I think it used to be a small thing, but it just got bigger and bigger, and bigger, and that became purse. But people still call them pocketbooks. One hundred percent, they're not. Um, hmm. Unless I'm wrong, maybe you're right. Or I'm thinking like, maybe they're, what's like like a backpack versus a book bag? You yeah, called a book bag. Yeah, but but I get what you're saying. I, I'm trying to think of things that fit that blind cap thing, yeah, where it's yeah, like yeah. they used to be called something, and we still call them that, even though they're no longer that thing. I'm sure mm. that there are other examples of that. Yeah. Anyway, cool. Or All like right. my kids are like, why do we call shorts shorts, but we don't call pants longs? <laughs> right. <laughs> because they're regular. Yeah. They're and why standard. is it why is it pluralized? It's one piece of clothing. Why is it called pants? Yeah, that's right. Tell me. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, man. Go figure. Somebody needs to make the authority on this. So there you go. Blind cap. I'm laying down the gauntlet right there. Cap that covers a filler knob. Okay. Question for you, Drew. It's from Emily. Emily Eli. Is it true that you can't write with other people's fountain pens because everyone's writing style is different? I'm so glad she asked this. (laughs) Because this is not the first time How I've heard this. How is this still cycling around? I don't know. Is one hundred percent still perpetuating this? I, this is not the first time. I, mean, I think someone else asked me. Oh, it comes too. up all the time. Yeah. No, it's a myth. It is absolutely a myth. It is an obnoxious, ridiculous, insane <laughs> myth. Unless you give your pen to a person that grips it like Shrek and tries to <laughs> murder someone with it, it's going to come back to you in a pre- mm. in the normal stuff. Um, it, it, these things are steel. And, and very strong gold. Like, you know, uh, simply writing with them properly is not going to do anything other than maybe not write if they're using a really funky angle. If they're using a really funky angle, it's just not going to work for them. But it's not like they've now made it theirs and they're the only one. It's like finders keepers, whoever thus possesses mine fountain pen is <laughs> doth the owner henceforth. Like, that's not the way it works. Mm. It's ridiculous. I can see where maybe some of the origin of this may have come up at one point when, I don't know, I have no historical basis for this whatsoever, but there was a time when fountain pens were basically the primary writing instrument. Everybody used them because they had to. That was just what you had available to you. Mm -hmm. Once ballpoints and other things came about, fountain pens became a little more obscure and a little more expensive and, you know, that kind of a thing. So... I could see in a time where things were starting to transition and then maybe there were some people who were not as experienced with fountain pens, but still wanted to use them, try them or whatever. I can see it being a great excuse for people that don't want other people to potentially ruin the fountain pen because they don't actually know how to use it and they're going to mash it down or ruin the nib or something like that. I could see that being somewhat of the basis of logic of like, oh, well, you can't, you can't use my pen because it's like specific to me and you know, you're going to ruin it if you do it, which like Drew said, it's like, if you let somebody borrow your car, yes, they might drive differently than you, but they're not going to like fundamentally change how the car drives unless they smash into a brick wall. Like unless they do something that actually damages the car, they're not going to do anything to that car. It's going to make it drive differently. Certainly not a, than what you would drive. Certainly not a stock fountain pen. If you have a customized nib that is added flex. It's been thinned out. It's been made a double, triple extra fine. And with those nibs, yes, the alignment is going to be very, very sensitive to yeah. anything different. If you give it to somebody who writes at a weird angle, it could come back slightly, slightly off and you could feel it. So the more- But again, that's only if you're like actually changing or altering the thing. If, you, if you're writing it with the pen, with the pen as it's meant to be written, yeah. you're not going to do anything- No. 
to that pen. If like, you're giving it to somebody that knows what they're doing and they're writing with it normally, your pen's yeah. going to come back to it would you be, just fine. It would be to go with like the car analogy. If you had like, I don't know, a, a, a car that you like lowered and it had slick tires and it was meant to be like driven exactly. on a track. Right. You don't take that off-roading. It's been customized to drive for a specific And also purpose. you don't you don't let your mother-in-law drive it either. Right. Like, exactly. That that that's a very so specific like, thing. I can see in specific. You're not gonna be like, hey, yeah, Granny, take this to go yeah. pick up some extra but mashed it's, potatoes. But, it, but it's nuanced. The the idea that like all fountain pens conform to the way that you personally write. Think about that. Think about that for like five seconds. I don't want to, because it's crazy talk. How, how differently do you think a fountain pen can write? Are you telling me that millions or billions of people that could potentially write with a fountain pen that it would like conform so differently to your writing style? Like that's magical. That's on. that that's no. No. Malarkey. Absolutely crazy. Hogwash, yeah. as they say. Unless you're just outright abusing it and ruining it, you're gonna be just fine. Let people borrow your pens. Borrow other people's pens. Use it. Be respectful. Be conscious. If you're letting somebody borrow your pen and it's clear they don't know what they're doing, coach them a little bit. It can be a great opportunity to be like, hey, you don't have to. So rather than being like, don't press it so hard, being like, hey, you don't have to press it that hard. Yeah. Like, this thing is just going to flow. Like, it's a great instructional time. And people can be like, oh, wow, this is neat. Instead of like, oh, it's this intimidating thing. Yeah. I mean, I've heard plenty of horror stories about coworkers, you know, grabbing somebody's pen and just ripping off a <laughs> threaded cap. Right. Or somebody, you know, just taking it and smashing it down and just totally ruining the nib. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about yeah. writing. Well, we're actually writing with yeah, you know, that would be like if somebody was like, you know, oh, can I like, you know, play your piano or something and like picking up the chair and like smashing it on the <laughs> keyboard. <laughs> like I'm playing piano. Like, no, you're not. Like what that's not- piano, dude? Oh, that's I not let somebody how else play. play it. But oh, like, you know you shouldn't have done that. Yeah, <laughs> Keys are everywhere. Like, th I, I would think of it like a, a, a fountain pen as a writing instrument. Yeah. Like I think more than, almost, yeah. more than almost any other type of thing that you write with, you could consider a fountain pen to be a writing instrument. Just like any other instrument, yes, it can be tuned, it can be customized, that kind of a thing. But anybody who like uses it mildly appropriately, you're not gonna fundamentally change how that instrument plays just by somebody else playing that instrument. Right. But you're gonna play it the best if you get familiar with it and you use it all the time. So it's much more the person that conforms to the pen than the pen that conforms to the person. So there you go. There we go. Use it, share it, enjoy it. Fountain pens are made to be used and loved. Excellent. All right, we got a two for here to round things out, Brian. Yeah, but question they're like, number five. They're kind of similar. And I added these in here because <clears throat> while we have addressed this before, not everybody is going to listen to nor should listen to every pencast. So, <laughs> oh, I disagree. <laughs> should listen to them all. Um, so we're going to cover ink expiration. Uh, Einzel.comf says, "Do inks expire? How long can we store our inks? Is there a way to prevent them from getting moldy?" And then mm. Hazemka says, what is the shelf life of bottled ink? What signs do you need to look out for before it gets mold? So this is a pretty frequently asked question. Mm. Um, people always post, you know, on Reddit, other places, whenever they have a crazy sludgy situation oh, yeah. and that gets people worried about their own stuff. So they ask oh, yeah. and, you know, it gets mm. perpetuated. So um, yeah, figured we'd tackle it <clears throat> another time. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's kind of two parts to this, right? There's like, how long will an ink last like realistically? It's not like, all ink is going to eventually become moldy. Like that's not that's not how inks, like that's not their ultimate future. That's not their fate, right, exactly. Right, like certainly that can happen. And like Drew mentioned, when it does happen, particularly if it's in like a dramatic visual fashion, that's what's gonna get posted online and it's gonna perpetuate like a fear cycle. Yeah, I mean, you've got inks that predate the company. Oh, uh, yeah. In your office. Hundreds that, that of are it. not moldy. I mean, how many thousands of inks have we sold here over the years and how many handfuls of them have actual like mold yeah. issues? Now, this is one so that I will few. say 100%. It's okay for you to say it depends. Well, I mean, I didn't even put that in my notes. What? Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, e ink storage and use has a lot of variables there. It can, yeah. But there's some very basic principles to right. ink storage that Lay are it on pretty us. solid. So yes, obviously it, it does matter how you store it and how you use it somewhat. Like if I only uh, pretty solid principles. my pens outside and leave my bottle open, you know, for my entire writing session while I'm out of the park. 
Yeah, then you're more likely to <laughs> potentially experience some... One might some, say I'm inviting. Some, yeah, yeah. You're, organisms. You're, you're not doing everything you can to prevent, you know, potential contamination from happening. Eating my right? sandwich and my crunchy Cheetos over top of my sure. ink, my private reserve wide mouth ink bottle. There you go. That's right. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> um I'm just picturing like Cheeto dust mixed with ink, like on your fingers into like a slurry. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, so first off, ink is it's a water based liquid. Right. So in, in reality, the dyes and the other stuff that are in. So I'm going to talk first about like just the storage and the expiration kind of date of ink. And then we'll talk about mold as a separate thing. Um, so ink is water based. You know, it's an or, uh, organic material to a degree. Um, and so it's going to degrade over time. That's going to happen. It's not intended. Fountain pen ink is not intended to be like a permanent ink. And in fact, even inks that are intended to be as permanent as possible are not truly permanent. They will break down over time. They are a physical thing. They break down. If you want something that doesn't break down as quickly, carve it into a stone tablet. Yeah, I mean, or it the paper is going to break down. But it will like, still break down. Something's like, going to break down. It's, so it's really just a matter of, how long does it need to last from a practical standpoint? And then is that meeting the purpose? And beyond that, it's great. Are you trying to pass down your inks multiple generations and store it for use in the year 2047? That, wait, yeah, that's not that far in the future. Like 20, 2407, that's what I was going for. Like that is, you're gonna have to go to much more extreme measures for storage to try to make something last that long because it's gonna degrade over time anyway. But in a practical sense, you don't have to go through the craziest of things to try to store your ink. But there's some basic principles that are pretty important. Um, so there is a shelf life of some sort to these inks and these dyes that are in the ink, but there's not a specific like expiration date that ink makers are putting on these bottles of ink. So it's not like you buy milk and you have an expiration date, that milk is going to expire, you know, this it's ink not, will self-destruct. I mean, <clears throat> it will maybe, but it like will be within a span of a, probably a couple of decades, not like a specific date that it's no longer good. And there's too many variables that happen in the meantime. So anyway, most ink is somewhat intended for a mildly immediate use, I'll say. It's not like most ink makers are saying, yeah, this is an ink that's going to last. It's not like when you make whiskey that's supposed to last like be like 25 year old whiskey or wine or something, you're like, you're going to put it in a cellar and you're going to store it for decades. Maybe ink makers are not, are not making ink to be like used and stored for that length of time. So it is made to be used. Um, and for that reason, they put, um, biocides and things that are, you know, intended to increase the longevity and decrease, you know, contaminants and other things from growing in the ink um, for a rather like relatively immediate um, uh, length of time. So I would say totally reasonable within a two to five year span, you really don't have to worry about pretty much any ink. If you're going for longer than that, okay, you may need to take some additional steps when trying to store your ink. Um, and the biggest things that are enemies for a long ink life. So the things you want to avoid, I think that's probably the easiest way to the frame, noid. It, frame it, avoid the noid. Um, UV exposure, UV exposure, sunlight, or even just, you know, UV lights just in your office or your Sun home. Sun is the enemy. Yeah, any light is going to break down specifically the dyes in the ink. Um, it's not like you're necessarily gonna have like mold and stuff that'll happen in there because of sunlight. That's other issues, but what's going to happen is that UV exposure is going to break down the dyes and the ink is going to fade over time. It's going to change color a little bit. Um, so that's the main thing you're trying to avoid with UV exposure. And that goes for ink in the bottle as well as ink on paper. So if you have writing that you've done as well, that you want to last a long time, don't keep it out in exposed sunlight for extended periods of time. It's okay. Use your notebooks, read them and all that kind of stuff. Don't worry about that. But you don't want to like leave an open notebook of something very precious that you've written by an open window for years because it's going to fade pretty much no matter what ink. Um, moisture evaporation. So if you don't have your bottle capped tightly or if the, the seal on the cap is not tight or you just have, you know, a really, really dry environment and you're leaving the cap off for extended periods of time over a length of time, you can have evaporation that happens. Now you can do it to a degree, reconstitute that ink because the dyes themselves don't evaporate. It's the, the water in the dye that's going to evaporate. Um, that uh, can be reconstituted, but how accurately can you do that to get it back to its original color and so on? Let me ask you a question, Brian. Yes. If I had an ink that I knew I was going to store for a long time and I questioned 
the integrity of the seal. Okay. Could I make a mark on the side of the glass where I knew the level to be at the time of storage and then say I revisited it in a year mm -hmm. or two? Yeah. And then I would, in, let's say the ink le the level was lower, I could just add water up to the line? That potentially, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's probably the, one of the better ways to go about doing it. Look at that. me, I just came up with one of the better ways. That's not a bad idea. Look at me. That's not a bad idea at all. You're welcome. If you think that like the process of storing it is going to, you know, cause some evaporation. Or if I possessed any sight, any uh, degree of foresight, which I absolutely don't. Right. But I, think, I think most of us right. like, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe if you're we like. We all intend to use the inks. Yeah, exactly. But we Like don't. how many inks do I Always. have? I'm like, do I even know where all these inks are? No, I just have them in like shelves and bins and all kinds of random places. And I don't remember the last time I used most of these. So yeah, if you have that kind of foresight, absolutely go nuts. Um, but yeah, or, you know, if you have like a, whatever, a swab that you did of the original and you can, you know, whatever, try to mix it back to get close to that. Um, so anyway, that's a thing. So moisture evaporation, you just want to be conscious of that. Um, extreme temperatures, particularly heat, because heat breaks all things down at some point. So if you, I don't know, have a bunch of bottles of ink and you store it up in your hot attic, it's not going to be great for it, you know, and that's only going to accelerate some of the other breakdown and some other potential issues you could have. It's only going to accelerate any potential contaminants. And if you do have any mold growth potential, that's only going to be worse in hot temperatures, right? So minimizing that, just having it at room temperature is ideal. Um, I know some people that like keep it in the refrigerator or that kind of thing. I'm not going to say that that can't work. In fact, some inks, like I know um, with noodlers, like some of their inks are like made for low temperatures, like the polar inks and stuff like that. You can actually put them in the freezer to store them for long periods of time. That's not inherently bad. In fact, it will just like all other foods and things like that. It will actually extend the storage life potentially. The only downside to that though, is those are very dry environments. You're more likely if the cap's not sealed all the way to actually have evaporation out of the ink. So is it worth it? I don't know. I would say probably not, because then you're also just like taking up room in your fridge with bottles of ink. Yeah, and somebody you're might of, you're, you're removing, grab it as a condiment or something. You're removing one variable and adding another. Yeah, to me, it's like not really worth the trade off. Um, and then the other big thing is contaminants, particulates, mold spores, Cheetos, Cheeto dust, um, even just like paper fiber from your nib. If you're not cleaning your pen on a regular basis, every time you dip that pen back in there. You know, there's static electricity that happens from the metal nib when you're writing on the paper that creates a static charge. It actually attracts dust into the feed. It attracts dust onto your nib. And all that stuff that can attract on there, the paper fiber as you're writing can like just tear up just a little bit at a time, kind of get in the feed and you go and fill in the pen. By the time you get through, especially if it's a larger bottle of ink, by the time you get to the bottom, there's going to be some some stuff in there. Some schmutz. You know, so um, that is something to watch out for. And, and especially if you're in like a, I mean, we had one customer one time that I remember who had some issues with mold growing in their ink. And it was with an ink that we really had never had mold issues with before. And it was kind of weird. Come to find out, they actually had, they were like renting an apartment. They had like black mold in their apartment. So they came to find out. Uh, and so it was like, they clearly had like mold spores in their environment that ended up just kind of getting into the ink just from being around stuff grew in there. And it was like, not a great situation for it them. Doesn't, it doesn't take a lot. Right. So one, I mean, one little catalyst. So, I mean, there are biocides and things that are supposed to be helping with that kind of thing. But again, the environment can be a big factor. And that's something that is, you know, difficult for us sitting here at a table saying, here's what you have to watch out for because there's so many different scenarios that could be happening across the world in terms of temperature and, 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 um, you know, environmental contaminants or whatever. So that's just something to generally be aware of. Um, so, but basically if you're storing your ink out of direct sunlight in a reasonable temperature and it's well sealed and you haven't contaminated like a bunch of stuff in there, it's going to store you know, for a relatively indefinite, reasonable period, probably decades, um, without doing anything too crazy. It's not a guarantee, but that's the best strategy to making that happen. Now, if you wanted to like seal it up in like a vacuum sealed bag or something, great. You're going to do even better, you know, that kind of a thing. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the best advice I have for just like a practical way of storing it. And most, most things come in some kind of box anyway. Some boxes are clear, some don't come in boxes, but if a pen comes in a box, that's all you need to do. You don't need to have it like in a box inside a drawer, inside a dark cave, you know, that's a bit extreme, but as long as you are not having like direct UV exposure, you'll be fine. 
Um, and then for the mold thing, how do you tell if it's moldy or if it looks like it's gonna get moldy? Well, you really can't do much if it looks like it's gonna get moldy because it doesn't really give you an indication until it's moldy. And once that's happened, it's pretty much happened and you can't really bring it back so easily. Um, so I haven't, at least I haven't heard of like lots of surefire ways to like save a bottle of ink if it gets moldy. I have not. Um, smell is usually a pretty good giveaway. I mean, inks have sort of a chemically kind of smell to it anyway. So many inks smell bad even they smell, when they're normal. They smell bad, but when you smell a moldy ink, you're like, oh, I thought I knew what a bad smelling ink was. But once you smell a moldy ink, you're like, oh, that's bad. Yeah. So it is kind of tough if you never really smelled moldy ink to know what <laughs> bad moldy ink smells like. But if you go smelling all of your ink, looking for a stink, you're gonna find a stink. You're gonna find, the inks, you're gonna find some stinks. Yeah, inks don't yeah. generally smell appealing. But. Well, yeah, they're like, I mean, most of them don't have any kind of fragrance in it or anything. So you're smelling, you know, you're probably smelling the biocides that are in there. That's yeah. probably they're, what you're they're, they're funky, but if they're funky in a different way than yeah. mold funky, that's a different funk. Right. Um, so sometimes you'll get like white kind of floaty stuff yeah. that can happen on the top of and the ink. Sometimes that's though there's some floaty stuff that's just like a separation. Like if it like yeah. some, like, like what you'd see on, you know, you'll see something a little bit more oily that can mm. happen, but that's not mold. Right. Uh, so sometimes you will see some floaty bits, uh, but it's But I'm not, talking like fuzzy right. caterpillar if, if it, type. Yeah, if it is a know. white circle with a gray center or something like, like that. Clearly classic like spores of something growing on your it. bread. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, that's, that, a that's usually a sign that's not great. And that will pretty much always accompany just a horrid smell. Yeah. That's the stuff that, that smells That, that mildewy, wet smell. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, I don't know if it's that white kind of mold spory kind of stuff or whether it's something else, but if that stuff like falls down into the ink and gets like stringy and kind of globby, and I'm talking like you can dip a toothpick in there. Sludge. And it, you dip a toothpick in and you pull out what looks like the wet end of a Q-tip, like that big globule. Yeah. You're like, that's not liquid. That's, that's not like supposed slime. to be in there. Slime. And that will often accompany a pretty terrible smell as well. That is a sign of mold. Um, there are, so th those are pretty much the signs that I know of. I haven't really seen too much else. Sometimes you, if it's a really light colored ink, you might be able to see stringy, like floaty stuff around in there. But that is tough because there are things like shimmer inks and inks that have particulate and things like that, that if you don't really have an eye for what you're looking for, you might wonder if it's mold, but really it's not, it's just particular. It's like sometimes there can be chemical reactions with certain dyes. Like if it's a really saturated ink color, I know this happens with um, Noodler's Dragon's Fire and Georgia Peach. There's like some of these like pinky orangey kind of colors. It's almost just like a something with the dyes. Something crystallizes. It like crystallizes. It yeah. almost looks like shimmer. Yeah. Um, that is a natural thing that happens just with the reaction of those dyes over time. That's not a mold, that's not a problem. So that's kind of specific, and, and but you really can't see them unless it's a really light colored ink. Most inks are pretty dark and you can't really see through it. So it's pretty much like fishing around with a toothpick. And toothpick is good because it's not super absorbent. Like a Q-tip, it's gonna be tough to tell because it kind of looks like Also, fuzzy. Thing, things anyway. can fall off of that. Yeah, you don't uh, want- Nothing can you don't fall off of a toothpick, really. Toothpick is relatively, relatively okay. Um, but anyway, so if you have that, or obviously if you're filling with your pen and there's like, you have a hard time filling because there's like globs of crap, then you want to clean your pen very thoroughly, you know, ideally with some type of cleaner that kills mold. Yeah. Um, but, you know. And any pen that it is touched. Yeah. I mean, you, you think of like horror stories of like, oh, I have moldy ink and then it destroys all your pens. That really doesn't happen very often. I hear about that so incredibly rarely. The only time I've really heard about that is with vintage pens where there is like, you know, a rubber sack or some like, natural material like a casein feed or something like that and the thing sits in there for a while maybe it has an issue but i mean i also in my previous life i power washed houses and decks bleach kills mold like it will indisputably kill mold it cannot survive so like you dilute some bleach and you clean that through the pen you don't want to like soak it because bleach can also do harmful things to metals but if you just kind of clean it through with a diluted bleach solution that'll pretty much kill the mold spores. So yeah. you don't, don't be like living in fear of like, oh, if I keep my ink too long, it's gonna turn moldy and then it's gonna ruin all of my pens. That is such a abstraction from what actually no. happens. I mean, it could make things smell bad. Yeah, it's not anything that I would lose any sleep over, just have and if general you go And if you go re-dipping into different inks, it can make different ink bottles moldy. Yeah. But like if you're using 
good sense in cleaning your fountain pens. Especially and you're like not, with modern inks, it's not as much an issue. Like the modern chemistry with most inks is, yeah. you just don't see this stuff I will nearly say as much anymore. From a customer care standpoint, we do receive more concerns about things that turn out not to be mold than we do things that genuinely do turn out to be mold. Which, look, if you're ever concerned, please reach out yeah, to let us like, know. a retailer or some pen professional. It's always better to get a confirmation. Yeah. Our team has seen a them. lot of pictures of funky ink. Yeah. So they, they but, it, they but in terms in terms of like actual mold issues that are really something to be of concern, <laughs> it's really pretty few and far between. Yeah. So there you go. All right. All right. Now nah, takes care of all of our Q and A questions. Now we're going to move on to our pen spotlight for the Jinhao X one fifty nine. Yeah, let's go, man. What you All got right. here? All right, what I got here, this is the uh, Jinhao X159. Um, the original 159 had a slightly different clip, slightly different center band, but the biggest thing is that it was metal. This one is not metal, it's resin. So it's considerably lighter, but it's still a very big pen. So I actually much prefer, personally. That, that other one was heavy. It was a monster. And I really like this one so much better. It's just a much more comfortable pen to write with. Um, and it's got a bigger nib. It's got the number eight nib. Yeah, that, that honestly thing. was like most of the catalyst of why we wanted this one. Um, not the best lighting there, I apologize, but you know, you can see a little bit there. We're gonna have good pictures on our site and I actually intend to do a separate video on this anyway. So this is kind of a run and gun style for us. Um, but we have the fine nib, one color, one nib size. That is what we have. Um, I inked it up uh, to do the nib nook. I used Noodler's Black, so it's not the most interesting <laughs> nib color, unfortunately, but um, it writes relatively smooth. Um, I did find uh, that the tines were just a little bit tight, mm. just a little bit tight, nothing crazy did or unusual. Did you do anything? Because um, I, when, I, when I wrote with it earlier, it wrote great. Yeah, yeah, no, it was fine, but I found that like it wasn't necessarily as forgiving on like the, when I rotate it in my hand, the line gets a little weak or would have some like breakage in the flow if I held it at a certain angle. I found that if I just pressed it just a little bit yeah. to, to open up those tines just a tad, it would increase the flow just a bit. And then it just, I had fewer of those issues. It didn't feel super stiff to me. Like the the actual feel of the steel felt, yeah, I mean, it's, felt a little, it's not, a not, pen. not bouncy, but I guess with the bigger nib, you're gonna get a little bit more. Yeah, just a natural like leverage. It's not like a super springy nib or no, anything. No, no, but it's, it's also not like a, it didn't feel sharp or super rigid to me. Yeah. I mean, it flows pretty well for the price. Like the nib is smooth. It looks like a much more expensive pen than it is. Um, and you know, we've carried Jinhao for a while. This is on the bigger side of pens. And the, the 159, we carried it in a lot of different colors back in the day, but they weren't super popular. They, um, you know, uh, had some different options. And this nib was one that was newer to us as an option. and. You know, the bigger the nib, the more impressive usually. So we wanted it as an option. Um, and, you know, this it's is my the only, first. It's the only number eight? It's the only number eight that we currently have, I think. Well, the, um, I, there might be one out there that isn't identified as a number eight. Okay. That's similar enough, but this is like officially a number eight. Yeah, it's big. It's a big nib. So, yeah, I like it. It's very inexpensive. Check, let, let me take a look at that feed. Cause that is a big chunky feed too. It is a big honking feed. Look at that thing. Yep. That's it's been, a it's a stand, feed. standard international, comes with the Jinhao version of a standard international converter. Right, exactly. Um, you know, so it's, I wouldn't take this converter off and use it on all my pens, no. but it gets the job done. That, that That's not a face sucker, is it right up front? That's just a little divot. A divot, I actually don't know. I don't know if that's like a pilot style where it fills from there. I'd be kind of surprised if it was. Yeah, probably not. Because I will say like when I when I use it for the first time, it took me a, a, a little bit to get the okay. ink kind of going Because for a big it. nib like that, a face sucker would be good. A face sucker would be good. I'll have to look into that more. Maybe I'll research that more for my full length video. All but right. This is kind of a more run and gun first impression style of pen. I have very big hands um, and this pen is, it looks kind of normal sized in my hand. Maybe even it looks kind of big, but it's, it's a big pen. It's a big pen. We have full dimensions on our site uh, and all that kind of thing. But um, yeah, all in all, I think for what, 15 bucks or around there that we're selling for it, it's certainly worth a look. And I think if you want a like big pen that you can kind of carry around and you don't really care if anything happens to it, then it's absolutely worth a look. I could recommend it. Yeah, definitely. And in a very affordable big nib, probably the most affordable, largest nib you can get yeah. at, our, at our store anyway. 
You know what we'll have to try though, Drew, is like, can we fit that nib in other things? Oh, we're gonna find out. My guess is probably not. I'm sure there's something. I don't know. On the pilot Yurushi, maybe? It'll be something that won't benefit <laughs> from that nib for sure. Yeah, this there is, will already be a better nib. This is on gonna the be thing. The, the lowest quality number eight Absolutely. nib you'll find anywhere. Yes. But you know, still, it's it's for the price, it's not too bad. No, not bad at all. Cool. All right, that's all I got for that one. All right. Now we get to go to Nonsenseville with what's happening. What's happening? So I just have a funny random story to tell you. Oh, please um, do. I was, uh, my, my son got a got some um, Halo, the video game. Uh, not mm -hmm. Legos, but the, whatever the knockoff Legos are. Mega, Mega Constructs, Mega blocks I think. Or, yeah, yeah. Whatever, yeah. So he was asking me about some of the weapons. And I'm like, oh yeah, then, then there's like a, uh, I told him like, there's this thing called a gravity hammer. He's like, wait, what? And I was like, yeah, and there's this thing called like a energy blade. Wait, what? What does it look like? I'm like, well, it's kind of like a thing. So I decided to draw it. And I drew something that was kind of like this. And, you know, it has the little grippy thing in the middle there with like, yeah. a, like a handle. Um, like, I don't know if you can see it because it's so white, but uh, yeah, right there. Yeah. Um, it's like, you know, the the you grip it and it's got these two spiky things yeah. and he looks at it and he's like that looks like a fountain pen nib and i was like all right well you know what yeah it's not a good drawing <laughs> so it might have been that i have fountain pen nibs on the brain but also you know what i'm proud of you just the fact that he's like hey, fountain pen nib there you go didn't say fountain pen tip said fountain pen nib so i was like good job my man raising him right good job little duder <laughs> so yeah that was that was an interesting little, little nice. story um on a sad note, uh, ooh, bum us out, please. Yeah. The uh, the Green Power Ranger died. What? Uh, Jason David Frank. Oh man. Yeah. Um, He's I, not of the age that you would expect. He that was to only forty nine. Wow. Yeah, suicide. Wow, dang. That Absolutely sucks. tragic. And I, I to he was like super involved too. Like he was you know, like he went to. Oh yeah, like Comic -Cons that was like his like thing. That was that was his his. The hmm. main thing, he was fully committed to being the former Green Ranger and loved it. Didn't was wasn't one of those actors. It's like, oh, I wish I could be remembered for something else. Like, no, he's like, I'm the freaking Green Ranger and the White yeah, Ranger. And the Red that. He did, he did. Hmm. And uh, I remember you you gave me my first Funko Pop. It was the Green Ranger because you know That's I'm right. I'm a, I was a, a fan, huge yeah. fan. Yeah. Wow. So, um, and he was also a fountain pen user, believe it or not. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I, I sent him some pens, and I, I had reached out to him. Uh, in 2020, um, and because I noticed he had uh, posted something about journaling, and I was like, "Hey, do you journal? Because you know, I got probably a better one for you." So I sent him a Lloyd Sturm, a, a, a White Tiger Pilot Metropolitan, because obviously the White Ranger, yeah, yeah of course. Um, and then uh, I think I sent him a, a Vac Mini as well. Um, okay. But anyway, he he loved them. He wrote with them. He posted. He huh. tagged us. Like it was super cool. And he sent me some videos thanking me. He sent me some autographs and you know autograph pictures hmm. like and then he sent me all of his original things that he wrote on when he first tested his fountain pens oh wow um and uh it was just a really cool moment because i was such a huge fan of power rangers you know you you, you and oh, i we both used, we used to like play power rangers on yeah the and playground. i was always the green ranger and i wanted to be the blue ranger yep. and everybody was like all right that's fine because nobody was the nerd <laughs> but you like blue that much I, I literally was just like i don't I, care i just I want like blue, blue. <laughs> i want to be the blue ranger like going back that far but like he was like like a celebrity deaths have never impacted me really. And mm. cause it's like you you lose who you perceive their characters to be and mm. who they're famous for. Mm. But like I kind of like I knew the guy behind this. Yeah, you like had um, direct contact with that guy. So yeah. this was weird. It, it and, mm. and and when I was a kid, he was like a hero and yeah. it, it hit me differently. Hmm. And um the, the fact that it was suicide too, like really uh, crushed. Safe. Yeah. Especially somebody who, like you said, goes to these events and spreads joy and yeah. you know, love. It's just, it's mm. really, really sad. So um, one of those sad moments where someone so outwardly supportive and caring to other people was really tortured and suffering inside. Mm. So, mm. Um, you know, talk to, talk to people, you know, ask people how they're doing. Just, you know, just, that's just such a tragedy. And mm. uh, it, it did definitely leave me with some, with some bummer feels. So, mm. Uh, that was a thing. And, you know, I bring it up just because, uh, I was thankful to have, you know, given him some fountain pens and, you know, he yeah. seemed into that. So, hmm. uh, yeah, normally we don't openly discuss any sort of celebrity, you know, customers, but he's no longer with us. So, yeah. uh, yeah. Hmm. Dang. So no, yeah, that's a shame, but yeah. <clears throat> that's thanks. Thanksgiving happened though. Okay. Uh, 
that was 180 on that one. That was delightful. Uh, no <laughs> tragic deaths in the family, at least. Hooray well, for that. That's good. Everybody's happy and healthy. I would, I would hope you wouldn't be um, here if that happened. No, well, uh, <laughs> relatively small family. Like, I, not, it's, it's, me, not meaning that you would be the one that would have a tragic Oh, I didn't take it that way, but you. thank you. I didn't mean it that way, but I was just thinking, like, how did that sound? I would hope that you would take the time that you needed if that happened in your family. Of course. Okay, let's get let's get away from that <laughs> that uh, whole topic. But yeah. Easy, easy Thanksgiving. My grandmother lives, like, pretty much right down Route 1 here. Yeah. It's easy to get to. Maybe 10 people were there. Um, it's still a good crowd. After my, yeah. after my uh, grandfather passed a couple years ago, she moved into a townhouse and your condo, whatever. Anyway, she owns it. It's one of the, not a rental, but. Yeah. You, you know. can own a condo or a That's, house. Yeah, I think, yeah. yeah. So one of those two. You can own but, or rent both of those. <laughs> well, what's the difference then? Uh, the condo, it gets very technical. Okay, never mind. The condo basically is like you, because my parents live in a condo, so in, in my degrees in property management, but um, the condo basically like you don't own the outside of the building. So like you pay into an association mm -hmm. that maintains the outside and usually they'll replace things like roofs and gutters and mm. they'll do all the yard work and the snow removal, all that type of stuff. But you own everything like on the inside oh, that's of what the it building. Is. A townhouse, you like you're they're usually usually connected, but you own the whole thing. Oh, okay. So there's a condo. Yeah. Okay. There's a condo. Okay, cool. Thank you, Brian. You're very welcome. Um, so it was more, more obscure things yeah, for you to go. learn about uh who was it in the beginning of the feedback there? Uh, uh, which one was it? Anne. Anne Strasco. Yeah. You're welcome. So that, that went well. Uh, all my family gets along with each other, which is just really, really delightful. I, wow. I feel very for good. fortunate there. Yeah. <clears throat> so that happened. It was good. Um, I made some cookies. Some of my, well, it, it's not my grandmother's recipe per se, but I did use the recipe that she had, but they're called forgotten cookies. And mm. my wife was talking about how she really likes meringue. Um, like, okay. you know, macarons and stuff. Yeah. And, and I said, well, have you ever tried Mimi's, uh, forgotten cookies? And she's like, no, no, those are weird. Those white lumpy things. I was like, yeah, those are, that's meringue. That's meringue. And she's like, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> like, yes, that's all it is. So I made them. So the cool thing about them, it's super simple. It's just egg whites and chocolate chips. Sugar. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but nice. sounds good to me. They're called forgotten because turn the oven on 350. Okay. Put the cookies in there. Just meringue, chocolate chips, yeah. sugar. And you turn the oven off and leave it overnight. What? Yeah. So they're forgotten. You just leave them in there. Yeah. You just leave them in there. So they don't actually. Like it has to preheat. Like it has to yeah, get up to a certain temperature. You preheat it to 350. But as soon as they go in, you turn it off. Huh. And forget about them. Interesting. And they they just, you sit there overnight. They said, you know, you know, about 12 hours or so. And um, you come back and there you, there you go. You got cookies. That sounds easy. It was fascinating. It was super huh. easy. It was interesting. Um not challenging at all, considering how few ingredients there were. And I'm wondering um, now why you didn't bring any of these in. Because I ate them. Because the <laughs> I ate them, they're gone. So you're just like telling me about um, these amazing cookies. You can I'm make like, them. You get really the kids good. involved. It's so super simple. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you can't really go wrong with them. So all right. just whip them up, plop them on a pan, forget about them. Love it. There we go. Sounds good. So that, that was actually pretty fun. And uh, mm -hmm. yes, Shannon liked them. And they're like, oh, these are meringue. Yay. What I think I'll do next time is use uh mini chocolate chips though instead of the big chocolate chips oh yeah because they don't melt because they uh, you're never, like you're not cooking them for like exactly a long they don't time. really have yeah. enough time to melt so um they are large right. and noticeable so yeah. doing the small ones might make it less large and noticeable anyway, fair enough we'll try something different but that was fun a little, hmm. little baking adventure nice um and i started a new video game brian because i hey. finished ghost of shushima um, okay. Which is the samurai game I was Where playing. Cherry blossoms are yes, happening. All, all the, the time. allergies <laughs> yep. in the trees. Yes. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, finished that. It was an amazing game. Very environmental, very relaxing at times. Nice. Like, I love those games that you can, if you don't feel like fighting or battling, you can just kind of roam about hmm. collecting resources or something like that if I'm yeah. just chilling. Or you're like, all right, I want to I wanna go do something. I want to conquer a, you know, outpost or whatever. Mm -hmm. That option is available to you. There you go. So I moved on to Horizon 2. The Forbidden West, oh. which is a post-apocalyptic game, but not like scary post-apocalyptic. It's like nature has taken back over post-apocalyptic. Oh, interesting. So not like a, it's a beautiful post-apocalypse. Like modern Chernobyl. Yeah, where yeah, there's like, exactly. Like older structures kind of yes. taken back over. Yeah, by lots of lush greenery over hmm. like, you know, collapsed skyscrapers and things like that. Hmm. But essentially it's an a future civilization 
but tribal civilization. So they have like leftover technology from mm. us, essentially, like a slightly future version of us. But other than that, it's all tribal, but uh, very visual game, very um, mm -hmm. like beautiful, beautiful landscapes and stuff like that. And again, mm. you can just kind of roam around if you want to, or you can say, you know what, I'm going to go, you know, hunt some machine monsters if you wanted to. So Ooh, machine um, monsters. Yeah, that that's harder to explain. But essentially, the world is inhabited by machines that look like animals, like okay. bear machines and stag machines. And like dino trucks? You know that show? Yes, I do know dino <laughs> trucks. Not exactly like dino trucks. That's what I'm picturing in my mind right now. Uh, dino trucks. Let's see, more like, <laughs> they look more like the modern Michael Bay Transformers than okay, dino trucks. Horrifying. Well, they're the enemies I mean, so yeah, yeah any yeah. but modern, they, but but not but not any machine but not animal. anthropomorphic like they still look like animals but okay but that know. level of detail all right i guess but all no right. it's a, it's a solid game beautiful and i'm excited about it um and that, that that's about it i could get more detail but that those are the highlights of what's going on in drutopia Sounds right now like a very solid i think after how long we went last time i think we've pretty much gotten everybody up to speed <laughs> on most of our happenings um no it's very solid uh, yeah, for me, I, uh, well, I was off. I took time off, which was good. Uh, I was needed. And, uh, we had Rachel's whole family, whole family come and stay with us for a week. So that was very exciting. Actually it was really great. Like normally when you're like, okay, we're all going to be together. Probably some of us are going to like, you know, not find the endearing qualities as endearing by the end of the week, maybe. It really didn't happen on this trip. Like, How often did really you escape outside into your shop? I mean, I would say that like the family, like now everybody in our family were like, Rachel's parents are matriarch and patriarch of the situation here. So they helped out, did their thing, stepped back, didn't involve themselves in things that they didn't want to. That's totally fine. Um, Rachel and I, her sister and my brother-in-law, we were doing the middle-aged parent thing just in the thick of it with the kids and the hosting and the coordinating all the meals and all that kind of stuff. And then the kids were being kids, but like our kids, my, so Joseph's 12, soon to be 13, Ellie's 10, soon to be 11. And then my niece and nephew are seven and five. So they're young, but not like, pick up everything off the floor and put it in your mouth right. young. Oh, that must have been nice. So like, and like our kids are the age where they can sort of be responsible for the cousins. Yeah. At and least tell them don't so, do that. Yeah. And they can like, hey, kids, go occupy yourselves. <clears throat> and they can kind of take that direction and they have things that they're into. And like the little ones look up to my kids. Mm. So they want to do all the activities and all that kind of stuff. So the kids like, you know, there was like a lot of coordination with the meals and the things and there were some fits and things that are natural. But like, it wasn't as like intense as when we were all dealing with toddlers and babies and the whole thing. Like we have been for the last decade plus in the family. So it was like, it was actually pretty great. Did and that kids respect. do the thing where they're pretty much eating a Thanksgiving plate with like a roll on it? Oh, they had a roll and corn and yeah. mashed potatoes. But my kids' palates are getting there. Yeah, Archer's was pretty much a roll <laughs> and maybe one other thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do? Well, our thanks, so Thanksgiving is a big deal in Rachel's family. Like we literally, the stuffing that we do, we cook the stuffing like inside the turkey. It's a whole thing. Old we school. have this very special like gravy that we make. Special gravy. Yeah. That like, so Rachel's dad was taught by like a world-class chef neighbor they had 30 years ago, had to make this like gravy from the roux from like parts of the like using the liver of the turkey and the whole thing so it's like you wow. basically like have to have like this specific like size of turkey to be able to make this thing so it's like it's a pretty special involved thing wow and her family's been doing it for like decades and the stuffing recipe that they do is like it's now like a fifth generational thing with our kids generation it was from rachel's great grandmother what yeah Oh my God. So like, and then this is not, you know, this is much the family I, family I married into. So that like Thanksgiving has been like their thing. Um, and so, yeah, it was a big, a big Tell thing. me that you had some equally legendary looking gravy boat for this stuff. Well. Because this needs to be no, in like we didn't. a chalice. Rachel and I are, are 
in the process of buying because we don't. You use, need to get that man a gr <laughs> the gravy boat of like, all gravy boats. Well, like when you have like a big turkey like dinner thing, you're using serving ware that you don't ever need in the rest of your life. This is legendary. Like, like, <laughs> like this is this is heirloom gravy, Brian. It is. This man needs it like is. so we need a gravy boat shaped like up. a Viking longship or something. No, no. Unfortunately, we we have inadequate gravy. Like support seafaring vessels, yes. yeah, yeah. Okay. So we're working on that. Yeah, man, we're working on that. I'll, 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 I'll hold you to that. I, I think I'm, Rachel's already ordered something. Good. Now it's like because we never think about it the whole rest of the year. I'm personally and invested in this now. The lead up to Thanksgiving is like, oh my gosh, there's so much going on. Because this is also like the absolute worst time of year for us personally. Like work gets the busiest. <laughs> Like in terms of yes, yes. remembering <laughs> these things, yeah. like just, just functioning and making things oh, happen yeah. is like a minor miracle. And we have like so many family birthdays and stuff on top of it in like the whole like later November in through yeah. January. And you get Christmas thrown in there and all that. It's the busiest time of year for the business. We have our company anniversary around that time too. There's just so much going Not on. Not time for gravy boats. Not I'm, Gravy boats are the last thing that I'm thinking about. <laughs> I'm gonna no, I'm gonna stay on you about that. I'll 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 make sure that Rachel. I, I believe Rachel's already ordered something. Right, I don't promise that it's like a Viking chalice level. If it's gravy not, boat, if it's not, I'll have to confirm. It's gonna be really if if it's not good enough. It's gonna be really weird when that man gets a gravy boat from me and it's like, who the heck is this man buying me gravy boats? Well, we'll be like, I'm we'll, sorry. I told him about the legendary gravy. I He's will not personally invested now. I will not. I will not let that rest <laughs> until I have confirmed with you that I have an adequate. <laughs> gravy delivery vehicle it needs to look like the fake holy grail in indiana jones 3 <laughs> you know not the actual one the the, the, the bull one that turned him into an yeah. old man and made a head explode yeah it look like that absolutely i'm buying my grandmother uh we've decided we need to buy my grandmother some tv trays some like foldy tv trays oh yeah. whenever we go over there for oh like there's never enough seating oh you TV always, trays we got tv trays everywhere now. yeah we yeah. need there there's always but she doesn't have any so people like holding it in their lap sitting on the couch i'm like oh, oh my yeah, god yeah so we're yeah. gonna buy her one of the things with a little Yep. Older thing. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I got. I think I have two different <laughs> sets of those in our house. Yep. Yeah, it's like tar it's like fifty bucks at Target. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's worth it. We just need to do it. Nobody's nobody's taking charge of that. So I'm like, you know, what? we're doing the TV trays. There you go. Before Christmas. There you go. We're getting her some TV trays. There you go. Mimi's getting some trays. That's right. Good stuff. Uh, I'll hold you to that. You better come to me for a right. on those trays. Yes, sir. Because you can get some crappy trays, and that's a bad experience for everybody. Oh, it's good. They're, I'm getting the cheapest ones they have. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> if it were, this, this, this is for somebody else. This is not for me. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, so uh, we had Rachel's family there. It was great. Um, chess was a big theme. Chess continues to be a theme. Played two games of chess with Joseph last night. And uh, I've been I've been playing more chess, and I'm I'm getting a little bit better. Oh, so I'm, I'm, there we go. I'm getting better faster than my kids are getting better. So I'm like, okay, I can hold it off for just a little <laughs> bit. Like, we'll see. But, yeah, um, my brother-in-law uh, – did not know how to play chess. Not at all. And I was like, hey, this could be like the thing from Thanksgiving 2022. You can learn how to play chess. And he was totally on board. So we pulled out the Super Mario themed chess board that we have. Nice. Our chess situation is wildly inadequate for how much we're playing it now. You would the think. Only, the only game of chess. We have two. We have two chess boards. One of which is this Mario themed right. one, which is confusing because the board itself is white and blue, but the pieces are green and red. So which one's supposed to be white and black? And then also the, there's characters that represent the different pieces, yeah. but like the bishop for the white side of the set is Daisy and Peach. The queen is Luigi. The king is Mario. So it's like, wait, like, yeah. what's the scene? And like the pieces aren't even the same. They look somewhat of the same shape. And then the, the pieces for the black side are, are, are the bad characters. It's Koopa and, and, right. and Bowser Jr. And all. And you're just like, <laughs> so my poor father-in-law, he knows how to play chess, but he was like, why did you move that? He's like, I'm like, that's a rook. That's not uh, a knight. And he's like, oh, freaking, you know. So it's like, the set is pretty confusing. You would think that Christmas <laughs> would be a good opportunity for someone to get someone a new chess set. You would think so. If someone doesn't already buy one i haven't bought one yet but i'm so tempted well that's the thing it's like do you buy one for the kids do the kids or rachel buy one for you the kids are super happy using the mario <laughs> themed one and i'm just like it's like extra taxing on my brain because i'm like what the heck piece what about is they, they make a harry potter lego one well i so joseph the, might like that the other legos the, the other the other chess that i have is a lego pirate themed one ah uh, which is even less clear what the pieces are oh. supposed to be. I, I assume the Harry Potter <laughs> one's pretty good because there's that scene in one of the movies where they're like riding chess people. 
Oh, I don't just, know. My kids aren't uh, Harry Potter it, anything. Yeah, I so. only saw the first two, three movies, and it's one of those. It might have been the first one. Hmm. I don't remember. Well, either way, what I need to do is get like a proper actual like chessboard that makes sense. Even um, though they're probably so still, they'll still, still want to play on the Mario one. Though. They are going to want to do that. Yes, but whatever. For my own sake, you know, it'd be nice. But you know, I so I my brother in law, God bless him, learned how to play this with his like kids asking for dessert and all that. I don't know how this guy was like able to receive any information about how to actually play this game. So I'm trying to teach him on this crazy Mario chess set with his kids, like asking for dessert and all this kind of stuff. But he stuck it through. We played several games and he went back and they they literally like two weeks ago had bought one of those like chess and checker kind of like all in one things. You know, just because it was like, well, they could get a checkerboard or get like a chess and a checker. So yeah, I bought yeah. the chess and checker one. And so he the, he went home and was like pulling it out and like playing. And I was like, go ahead. Like it actually stuck. Like, so that's a thing now. Anyway. Nice. But it's pretty fun. So anyway, the chess theme continues. And uh, I'm watching more YouTube videos. And I have an account on chess.com playing some people online and so on. They have bots that you can play against. So you can play against like, you know, uh, what's her name? Beth Harmon from... Uh, Queen's Gambit, you can. They, they, she has a bot, so you can play her. She's really good. I'm it, not good against her, but anyway. I'm familiar with her on Peaky Blinders. Oh, well, there you go. The actress. There you anyway. go. Nice. Um, so yeah, um, that happened. Uh, but the whole like Thanksgiving thing, that's like there's like been like a passing of the torch to do the turkey and the whole thing. It's like an. Do you hour, have the gravy recipe? It's like an hours long situation. Yeah, like we oh. last year we had an official like, okay, my brother in law and I, we are going to like take the torch from my father-in-law. He's was still, it like, on a scroll? He still helps. No, we did like video, like phone video footage. I mean, we have like the recipe written down. It needs to be on a scroll. But it's like, it's a whole process. With a ribbon and a wax seal. <laughs> what century do you think we're in, Drew? This like, is legendary <laughs> gravy passed on from generation to generation. Rachel's great grandmother was not like from the middle ages. I feel like this, 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 this tome deserves <laughs> <laughs> its due respect. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, I'll work on that. Oh man. Yeah. Um, we also made gingerbread houses. So we had like all, all kinds cute. of like crafting activities and stuff like that. Uh, Rachel found some. So I was like, initially I was like, you can buy gingerbread houses that are pre-assembled houses. And then you basically just decorate the houses. And at first I was like, come on, can't even like build your own house. She said it was like $2 more. And Oh my gosh, it made everything so much easier. Because when I mean, you're all, with young kids, they're and all inedible to like, anyway. You're trying to like glue the house together and they're like falling apart. And they get so upset. And they get so upset. This was like just a beautiful gingerbread house making experience. <laughs> so, you know, there's something to be said for that. So we did that. That was a lot of fun. Um, did cut some trails out in the woods, Ooh. did get some outside time. Um, prompted by my my father-in-law and brother-in-law. They were like just as excited to go out there and because they live in like suburbia, yeah. Northern Virginia. I would be too. They don't like cut trails in woods anywhere. So just like getting to do that was like a thrill for them. And I'm like, great. Like I love doing it and free labor and they're helping me make you trails. You know what you should do? Did you give them machetes? We didn't use any machetes. See, I would be like, yeah. if I had the trails that you had, I'd be like, all right, let's go walk the trails. Here you go. Your machete for you, machete for you. You know how exciting mm. that would be? Yeah. They'd go like back jungle, and like, I got to walk around yeah. the trail. He gave me a machete and he said I could just chop down anything oh, I yeah. wanted. Oh, yeah. We're using all kinds of crazy stuff. Okay, good. As yeah. long as you have guests oh. chopping oh, yeah, fun tools. Chopping things, cutting oh, things up, yeah. moving around, getting nice. dirty. Yeah, absolutely. That's the whole thing. That's rad. Um, yeah, and just lots of great like family memories and stuff like that. So it was nice. Like there were like some separate rooms. Kids would play games or watch things, and go people would go into different rooms. We'd be outside. We'd do different things. So I have a of, question for you. Good, okay. You have to be honest. All right. When you're out in the woods, sometimes okay. If you see a tree that's like 100 percent rotten, oh yeah, and you're like, I could knock this thing down. Oh yeah. Do you just just uh, just plow into it? Oh yeah, of course. Oh yeah, I'll My just man. like kick it or yes! push it over. Or whatever. I'm so glad. Yeah, of that course. makes me so happy. Okay, good. Heck yeah, that's what I would do. That's tons of fun. You can't stop yourself. You're oh like, my gosh. You're yeah. like, you look at it, you're like, I could, I could, I could knock that thing down. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. <laughs> And like most of my woods is like crappy pines and stuff. Oh and yeah, they're like tons of them are just dying. So do you, so, do you like give it like yeah. a, a push? Like oh yeah, you're going down and then oh you're yeah, going you full can look, on. yeah, you can tell like the bark's all falling off and like <laughs> yes. half the tree's already degraded. And, you're and then like, you just okay. and then you just turn into a lumberjack ninja. Yeah, you're like karate. You're like I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna karate kid karate kid this thing and just like yes. punch the tree down. Oh, that makes me so happy. Yeah, you do feel pretty awesome when, you, oh, when that happens. I love that. Yeah, um, so that is fun. Um, quick little thing, but that. 
whole like leaf blower frame rigmarole thing that I yes, attached to the front of my lawnmower. Weld that yeah, you know how I broke it? Well, I fixed it. I welded the living crap out of it and reinforced it all and it's good to go again. Nice. Now that all the leaves have stopped falling. So I've sort of like broke it right at its peak and then had to kind of do it. And then by the time I got around to fixing it, all the leaves are not falling anymore. So did you put up any next lights? Year, like Christmas lights? Yeah. Inside our house, we're Inside, starting to decorate. Yeah. yeah, we don't really do outside because we don't. We live kind of in the woods, and yeah, I mean, I guess, really I guess if your at. family came after Thanksgiving, that would be different. Yeah, they all they all left like yeah. Saturday. So yeah, that's after pretty, Thanksgiving. Unless anybody's coming over for Christmas. Uh, we're I, I don't know what we're doing for Christmas, but I don't think we're doing a big yeah. big old shindig like yeah, this. I guess so knows. I mean, we're gonna do stuff for us. We put up our tree when we like started decorating yep. it and all that kind of stuff this weekend. So, you know, it'll be a thing. But. Um, yes, did that. And then, uh, yeah, this is our busiest time of year. So we're just resting up, gearing up, doing a whole bunch of things. That's pretty much it for me. Not a lot else. Yeah, I, I put up uh, our lights. Um, I finally got somebody to come and look at the... Uh, uh, the the outlet that so, will not be fixed. Yes. So <laughs> he, came, he came, looked at the uh, GFCI outlet on the back, opened it up, and like there was definitely some evidence of Pest some arc, shenanigans, some, some arcing. Yeah. Ooh. So one of the the uh, the ground wire was okay. uh, no, sorry, no, the ground and the uh, positive, no, negative. The white, white's negative, right? White is neutral. And, okay. So the, the black, ground, black is the hot wire. Ground and neutral were like sooty. So something happened. He's like, it's fine now, but definitely something did happen in here. But everything's Yikes. been replaced. But he did say the 15 amp that I had would be fine to go in, that I can do it myself. So I'm like, okay, great. That's all I needed to know. Okay. Better safe than sorry. So I'm going to go ahead and just replace that. But the lights on the front of the house, completely unrelated. What? Really? They're just, they were just legit broken from the power washing. Get out had of Had nothing to do. Uh, both the, the GFCI is dead too. So there is a GFCI dead on the back of the house. But it's not related. Not related. There is power going to the GFCI. There's power going to the lights. Are so, they even on the same circuit? I don't know. Totally they might. They, they might be. Wow. I can't. I can't know because the GFCI won't reset. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I can't tell. The reset button's just like. Nang, 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 you nang. said if power is going to the lights, then. So it's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's nothing. probably on. It's on a different circuit. It's just, yeah. Wow. Two completely unrelated things. That so now you would I need think to, would be tied together. So now I need to get back in touch with the power washing guy and see if he can compensate me for the lights. Yeah. Because he did. He did offer that earlier in the he year. Broke your lights. Yeah. But it's been like six months so i don't know if he's still gonna be cool with that or not so right. you'll just have to leave some some scathing reviews on yelp or something and i mean right I'm i thought kidding. about that like <laughs> I, I well i mean i thought about that he did say if if, if, it, if it does turn out to be our fault you know we'll work with you and if he does not work with me i will say hey this company did this a good happens. job but you know these this thing happened and this thing happened i did take six months to get an electrician to look at yeah, it yeah i'll be honest but but i will you know, i will yeah. say something you know yeah. But yeah, so the saga continues. Unfortunately, wow. yeah. need to so buy some, need to buy some lights with or without help. Mm. Dang. Yeah, Sorry. but at least there are enough Christmas decorations on the outside where everything is adequately lit. <laughs> there you go. You just leave those up for now on. Yeah. Problem solved. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, cool. Well, that's what we got happening in our lives. We're at the tail end of things here. A couple of quick company company updates, and then we'll get on our merry way. All right, so this is our busiest time of year. We have now kicked off things with our Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Cyber Week. I don't really know what to call this time right now. Even as a retailer, it's very unclear. The word cyber seems a little... A little dated, A little dated, right? yeah. No yeah. one uses that word. Cyber Week on the net. Yeah, exactly. You know, like a little bit same, of that same, same late era. 90s mm -hmm. era kind of thing. Okay. Um, anyway, so... That's uh, happening. So we've just finished a lot of sales. I guess we still have some things on sale and there's good stuff yeah. happening on our site. We there, still have there are some products stuff. that are launching. Yeah, like I think the Ferris Wheel Press stuff will be on sale for a little while longer. Yeah, That's we still like got, a, we that, got, that wasn't specifically a Black Friday thing. We got Private Reserve Inc. for all yeah, the Yaffa pens. That's going to continue. Like, we have some things that are continuing, so don't feel like you missed out on everything. But we're not like... We're not like doing super crazy stuff this year sales-wise, but you know, there's lots of good things that we're having happen and we still have lots of products to launch too that are coming especially in the next like week or two and then things will slow down a little bit kind of right up before christmas um so that's all happening 
And then uh, we've been a little lighter on the video side. We're shooting a bunch this week that we'll then have to like schedule out over December. Um, but we did get one out on the psychology of niche interests. This is an interesting video. This is a different different vibe than most of our other videos. More of a but very reaction. informative. I, I I was entertained by it. Yeah, I was entertaining myself in that one. So if you haven't checked that out, go uh, look at it. A little more psychology kind of themed one. Um, Not about any specific pens, but no, but about I kind of pen theme it. What? Know, makes the pen brain yeah. tick. Yeah, exactly. So you can go check that out. Uh, and that's kind of what I have at the moment. And then we can go ahead and wrap this thing up. We did have a really delightful Thanksgiving uh, event at work. We did. Yeah, I didn't that, talk about that. Did that I? was delightful. Yeah, we had a, we brought in some lunch, some catered lunch, and then we had a bunch of folks bring in it some was kind of potluck style so stuff to good. supplement. It was probably the it was really good. I don't know if it was because we hadn't had one in a long while, but a few years, for yeah. me it was like the best company event we've ever had. Yeah. Everybody really, was happy, laughing. Yeah. It was just like was good, uh, good vibes. All all the years of COVID. Well, it was like on our work anniversary too. Yeah. That's like, when we just happened to work out <clears> on our schedule. It's we have a really good environment here as an office. We really do. And it's one of the most amazing things about working here and you know being here for as long as i have and then having you know years of it feeling not the norm and like missing that that delightful x factor that this place has is just like oh it's just not a it wasn't bringing me down but i just <laughs> i knew what it should be and we've had people that we hired Oh, yeah. during, during the pandemic, and and there was this thing in my brain. I'm like, you don't know how like cool heard, it is. Heard of like past like, events and stuff. Yeah, I'm like, oh, you don't know. know. When we get together, like it's so great, but it hasn't happened. And then it yeah. happened, and it was amazing. <laughs> like so many desserts. Oh my gosh, I turkey, so much ham. I was like trying so hard. Like, okay, so and so made this cornbread. Somebody, oh, somebody else made this, this cranberry stuff. Like, I got to try a little bit Hot of everything. Apple cider and I got to try pot. everything that everybody brought in, so oh, I can see man. how their cooking was. But then it was like. I ate so much food. I it was, was so, so good. I was like comatose after they had, that. They had, they had mums <laughs> decorating the kitchen area and then they just, they drew names and I got to take one home. Like, man. That's awesome. Just a delightful day. Just good a times. delightful day. Good times. Yep. Glad to be doing that again. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to wrap this thing up. We've got a weird fun fact for you. So hang in there for just a couple more minutes. All right. Well, thank everybody for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Um, ask us some questions. We always appreciate those. Uh, check out goodlaypens.com and our YouTube channel and all these such things. Um, and you can email us at pencast at goodlaypens.com if you are an audio listener. Okay, my random fun fact, Drew. This one's credit to Adrian. She shared this with me. I had, yeah. not, I had not heard about this. So there's a big, big whoopsie going on for more than half a century, okay? So in the Turkmenistan desert, there's a crater dubbed the Door to Hell. So picture a 230-foot, 71 meter across hole. I have a picture there for your sake. Uh, it's 65 or 20 meters, 65 feet, 20 meters deep. Um, that's been actively burning for more than 50 years. How is that a whoopsie? I will explain it. So it's, it's history is somewhat up for debate. We didn't um, do that, did we? That's not well, a human thing. Yeah, well, yes. What? It is. I'll get to that. Um, it's history is somewhat up for a debate due to the I'll call it the lack of availability of Soviet records that were happening around the time of that expedition. Um, but it's mostly speculated that this hole was created or discovered around 1971 when scientists were exploring the area for oil deposits. Uh, they were testing different spots for oil quality and they basically inadvertently opened up what turned out to be a natural gas deposit in this area. And natural gas is poisonous when it's let out into the air. It's not good. You just not good for the environment to just like let it spew out. It's a very superficial natural gas deposit. So, I mean, literally like they were just like driving around their equipment and the equipment supposedly like, like kind of fell into this like giant hole that was a natural gas deposit. So, um, you know, they, it's poisonous, not good for the environment for it to just like spew out of there. So, uh, cause it, natural gas can't be stored like oil. It has to be basically processed immediately when it's kind of harvested. Otherwise it gets into the atmosphere and like poisons animals and plants and things. So not great for that to happen. So burning it off is the industry standard method for dealing with extra. So they did that um, on purpose. Things. So they did it on purpose. Yeah. It was cause it was like, okay, well this, this thing just sort of happened. Like it was an accident basically that they exposed this deposit. And um, 
it uh, the the best thing at the time. They thought like, oh, okay, it, you know, how much can really be there? It's a very superficial deposit. We'll just burn it off, and probably after a couple of weeks, it'll just kind of fizzle out. Well, it's been burning now for fifty years, and <laughs> there's no signs of letting up. They really don't know how long it's going to keep going. So, um, yep, there you go. It's uh, become a tourist attraction, somewhat of a tourist attraction, and uh, it was even shown in some scenes of the 2014 Godzilla film. Oh, that was a good movie. So yeah, there. Well, the whatever scene I haven't seen that movie, but whatever scene has a remember. fire pit in it or something, it's a gigantic gigantic fire pit it looks pretty rad I don't that um, I'll anyway, do it. i'd never heard of this thing and then uh if you look at pictures of it it's pretty pretty crazy looking um, that's insane yeah. isn't that wild <laughs> that, that that's like what would happen if you found it looks horrible. if you found like the, the the main yellow jacket nest of the entire earth like i feel like that's what you would do yeah today. this is pretty much when i see a yellow jacket nest this is basically <laughs> the image that comes into my mind is a door with l um, anyway, that's your fun fact. For Dang, the I did not know it kinda, any of that. It kinda, I've never, never heard of it, but wow. yeah, it's a thing. I've heard of that one city that is like burning underneath of it. Oh, that's in like Pennsylvania. Like Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. a mining accident or yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's still burning. Still burning after like 30 years or something. But yeah, this is new. This is new. Yeah, no, this is uh, somewhat natural, but also unnatural. Yeah, yeah. definitely human. The cause. solution was unnatural. <laughs> I mean, I guess at some point, probably that deposit would have just like spewed natural gas into the air and that wouldn't have been good. So, you know, yes, humans caused it, wow. but it's like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to feel about this thing. Wow. Humans are doing all kinds of crazy things. But anyway, there you go. There's your Do with that what you will. Now you know about it. <laughs> I think that's all we got for this week. There you go. And we never really addressed our sweaters at the top of this thing, Drew. What do you we'll have there? Is, it, is, is, is this is a be... new sweater. So it says Felice Navi Dad. Oh! Yep. And it's got so a, it's like a dad. You got chainsaws. It's a dad, yeah. You got dr power drills. Drills, coffee hammers, cups, coffee cups. Saws. Yep. Can I have one of those? I don't have one. Yeah, right. And then on the back. I don't know if you can see it. Pure says, dead. That's not going anywhere. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. Which is funny because I literally say that to Rachel all the time. Nice. If I need to go to the dump and I got to tie something down in the back of the truck. Oh, so many ropes are happening and all that. And I'm like, that's not going anywhere. I say it all the time. So yeah, this was a spot on Rachel. You're, you're, you are very thorough when it comes to tying things down. I have lost things on the road before. So yeah. Remember that I'm time we sure you remember that time that. we got a hand truck stuck in your old car and mm -hmm. you had to like take apart parts of your car to get it out? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a while ago. <laughs> but yep. That wasn't you though. That was just a weird that had nothing to do with tying it down though. I don't think so. That was just, it like just got wedged in a stuff. weird yeah, way. Yeah, wedged in some weird thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I thought happen. about you the other day when I was um decorating for Christmas and I was yeah. getting my mm -hmm. extension cord all tangled up and I'm like, "Man, Brian's got a very, very good method for wrapping extension cords that I could have used I right do. now. Yeah. I always get tangled up. I don't think I want any extension cord that's like more than 20 feet now because it's just, it's just, you're asking for tangles. I got a couple different much. methods for, I'm sure for you extension do. Extension cords. You probably have an app for it. <laughs> <laughs> I do actually have an app <laughs> for tying knots. Oh, no, I know you have the knot one, but does that one? I'll, I'll look it up later, but we'll <laughs> see if I. Grog knots. That's the app that I have. I should. It's really good. It's really good. Anyway, that's all we got this week. Thanks, everybody. We'll catch you on the next one. Right on. Bye.